think I, I have anything back further from uh, what, disabilities because there was an outstanding question about the completeness. Do you want to <coughs> take that up in two weeks or do you want to take it off the table now? Uh, um, I, normally I put it on the agenda if we're going to pick it up again. Okay. But I don't think I have a further correspondence. If you, you hang might, on a second. You, you, you might want to come back in, in two weeks. It's not on our agenda, and I know it's important to you, but. So you didn't send it back yet? Well, he may have, but not in time for the agenda. So when something's on the agenda, it, it's kind of tough to that take that it off. Uh, you know, we technically, I guess, could, but it's not the best way to. Because we have to comply with the meeting laws. Hang on, hang on. So um, we have a request, a point of information. And so, Kira, I don't know if we received any further communication from the Commission on Disabilities relative to a handicapped parking Taylor. place at Taylor Street. We, Yeah, so um, I don't have anything new before me on that, but I can follow up for the next meeting. Yes. Sure thing. Okay, so I'll accept a motion to accept previous meeting minutes. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So um, Ryan sent us out at least two sets of minutes previous to this meeting. If the members have had an opportunity to review them, and yeah. I would entertain a motion. Uh, approve both the prior meeting minutes. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. That is approved. Okay, so um, on the next items on the agenda, we have items two through six of the package. Through six that relate to pilots. The motion to suspend the necessary rules to take up two through six of the package. Oh, I. Not hearing a second, I guess we'll take them one at a time. I guess there may be a question on something. Okay, so uh, motion to take up item two. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So item two filed by Councilor Lisi ordered that the City Council approve and ratify an agreement between the City of Holyoke and Ryan and Boudreaux, LLC, care of Robert Baker, in accordance with Mass General Laws, Chapter 59, Section 38H, for payment in lieu of taxes of certain personal property tax obligations. And I see that we have our chief assessor here, so would you like to come in and, because these will all be similar, although not identical. Mike on Tony. Do you wanna sit, do you wanna come inside and sit, Tony? Yeah, yeah if you wanna grab a mic. field cards for the certain parcels in question for the ordinance okay. um, I've done calculations on each of them for um, what there are existing use right now and then what the use would be after if you go if you, if the committee would approve the ordinance for these um, it shows a residential tax rate and then it would show a new tax rate if it were to change into a solar field also the, it shows the difference on each of the field cards so you'll have those with you and the total that i come up with just for this fiscal year would be a difference of about sixteen thousand seven hundred and three dollars that would be added just on the resident i mean on the on just the regular taxes for the real estate for the property now if there's also fences paving, lighting added to these parcels, those would be also added on as extra value. And um, and that's in addition to the energy Yeah, um, every, every itself. the precedent itself from the um, law department and the gas and electric is 5,000 per megawatt, and that's a flat fee. So if we have six parcels, I'm just guessing that it would probably be about six megawatts for the six parcels. 
So that would generate an extra $30,000 in revenue for the city. Okay. Um, and you know, depending on one of them might be a half or a 0.8 of a megawatt, but we can just, you know, justify the, the taxes according to what use they have on the megawatts. Okay. So what was not completely clear to us at the last meeting also was if all of these requests for the pilot were for projects that had already been approved okay. um, by the planning board there some question arose about the status which i believe may be why we're looking at each of right. these separately so for the um agenda item that we're on now yeah uh that would be the um the uh, baker and king mm -hmm. property mm -hmm. and um, the added revenue for those would be um 1661 for parcel two and 1883 for parcel uh, three and also an extra ten thousand per megawatt. I mean, there would be probably be two megawatts, so you'd get an extra ten thousand. I'm I'm just basing it on m one megawatt per parcel, because that's about you know what I've been told you know in dealings. And do you have the address for this property? Yes, um, the the two parcels here. There's um, the one seventy six two is there. That's three oh seven Whitney Ave. And the other parcel is just no address. It's just Whitney Ave. There's no number, and that's 176.3. I do have all those parcels in there in the packet I gave to. Okay. So. Is that along the railroad tracks? Uh, it's you know where the, there was a fire there last year, mm -hmm. the King property, Light mm -hmm. Light of King. It was if you're going along, you you couldn't really see the house there. Mm -hmm. but the, I think there was some squatters in there and stuff, and there was a fire there last year, and it's it's not visible from Whitney Ave, though. And the project won't be visible either. I don't. I, I'm I'm not positive on that. Yeah. But there's enough trees there where you know it's it's pretty it's pretty blocked. Okay. Okay. Are there any other questions from members of the committee? Um, thanks. Lisa. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for coming down, Tony. So, um, just to be clear, so this item number two, there's three parcels associated with it. There's two parcels. Two parcels, um, and they're both currently residential. Um, yeah. Uh, they're assessed at residential rates, and if we um, approve the pilot, not only do we increase the amount for each parcel, the first parcel by one thousand six hundred sixty-one, but the second parcel is an increase of one thousand eight hundred eighty-three dollars. Correct. So, an additional. And then um, the additional, if for the megawatts, if it's two megawatts, it would be ten thousand dollars added. Also, so plus, plus, I'm not sure how many feet of fence there would you have, so the fence would be added, and if there's any paving and lighting, so those would be part of yard items that would be also added. Sure. So I just want to make sure that it's really clear for yeah. uh, the members of the public and also for those that may be listening at home that um, for this first pilot program alone. Um, the city would be receiving an additional roughly $3,500 in taxes because we're moving the tax rate from a residential rate to a commercial rate. And then on top of that, we're getting a generation fee of an what was it per megawatt hour? $5,000. $5,000 per megawatt hour. Oh. Yep. Thank you. Councilor McGivern. Thank you. Tony, um, you said you were based your estimates on one megawatt. Yeah, I mean, most of the, the the ones I have down on um, gas and electric is like four and a half megawatts through the two parcels. So that's about $22,000, $22,250 that we receive from the city, from uh, gas and electric for the two sites on Mueller Road and Meadow Street. But if, if we adopt these, yeah. the tax rate will be according to the size of the solar field? Well, no, it's at 5,000 per megawatt. So if it was a half a megawatt, it would be 2,500. For can, can you adjust it according to the megawatts? Yes. Yeah. Tony, the state dictates all taxing schemes, and I'm guessing this Mass General Law 59, Section 38H allows us to do this? Yeah, and you, what, the, what the thing for us is we're in constant contact with the DOR 
So with, with the two G gas and electric properties, because it was a third party constellation, we taxed them for the solar. We built in the value on those two properties. So on, and I put the field cards <coughs> for those two properties in the packet also. You'll notice that the value comes out to like $220,000 per site for those megawatts. My, my question is, if we, we cannot control our own taxing schemes, we can only go accordingly to how they're allowed through the state and by the state. Right. Um, why are we creating an ordinance? Why aren't we just accepting the law? I, I, I was just called in. I mean, the, 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 probably the use would change. The use is going to change because it's no longer a residential property. It's a commercial or industrial property. So the tax rate would change on those properties. Hey, it, it, this is just more of a, I'm, I'm in favor of yeah. using the law, but I think procedure, I'm just trying to figure out why we're creating an ordinance. Well, in, in the long run, it could look like we're trying to create our own taxing scheme. Well, I think it just makes it more uniform. So for future, um, for future you know, projects, we probably have some more. I mean, people are trying to take advantage of this because the federal tax credits run out this year. So there, you know, you're going to have, yeah. If, yeah. if I can, if I can clarify, yeah. the reason that these are before us is because they're a pilot <coughs> agreement yeah. negotiated and approved by the mayor, and they're coming to this committee simply to be accepted. But in the context of them coming into committee, I think because there were so many of them, and the status of at least one of them is in question, the committee wanted to have more information as to how it is affecting the taxes and the property use. The answer is my question. Okay. And, <laughs> and, I, and I would just like to note for the record also that this lot at 176 um, Whitney Avenue prior to, and it's my understanding it's been approved by the planning board for the solar thing, was a buildable residential lot. So if there was a home to be built on that lot, I'm going to venture that, you know, it would have been generating taxes and it is in a residential zone so I just think um, and this is under review in this committee and with the planning board right now as to what impact it is having on the zoning and the people who buy on Whitney Ave in a residential zone what their reasonable expectation of what will be happening in their neighborhood is so I mean I know you're just doing it under the law as it sits right now um, but this project and one other that we will address further down are the main reasons that the citizens have requested this to be addressed. No so, thank you. Are there any other questions? Councilor Jourdain? Yeah, <clears throat> I just came from the planning board meeting. I apologize for uh, not being late, but I did have another matter that I had to handle there. Um, maybe you've addressed some of these questions, but I do. These are important for me to understand this. Um, with respect to these properties, uh, some of these are residential currently, some of these are commercial. Explain um, the why we would want to do a pilot as opposed to they put the solar personal property onto the property. So conceivably, they're making some money, right? So like for example, and again, explain where the law allows. If I have, I want to take a commercial venture, compare it to solar, and then you can explain the distinction. If I have blank piece of commercial property, it's worth X if it's undeveloped, right? Potentially developable. I would assume all of these obviously are potentially developable. That's why they're being used. Um, then I put a building on it that generates X amount of income off of it. That property becomes worth more, obviously, with a building on it, and it's generating some income. To the, to the owner. And I assume through Patriot or whoever that you're using, they send them different forms to calculate how much money is generated off of the new use. Conceivably, there'll be some level of disclosure required in all of these agreements. Okay, so that's the normal commercial. I build up a building and I do some manufacturing or whatever have you. Okay, now solar field. I have a same commercial piece of property. Um, and now I put solar equipment on it and I'm generating an income. Why do, why is this in our best interest to do these agreements as opposed to can I tax the solar equipment as personal property 
And secondly, are, isn't that property potentially worth more with them generating um, income off of it in terms of, uh, the, I'm sure these people that are purchasing these things and putting it on there are, are earning a certain amount of money because they're selling the power to whomever. Well, the, the one thing about the solar panels, they'll depreciate down to zero. So if we can get a regular stream of income on the 5000 per year, that's not going to change. What's so, the depreciation schedule on well, these? It'd be over 20 years, it would, the panels would depreciate down to zero, you know, 20 okay. to 30 years. But these programs are all brand new, too. So I, the, the state, we had a, 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 a long two months with the state for the original gas and electric one, and it was approved by the state. It was just had to, we had to put it through the real estate. So, I mean, the, they've looked over these contracts with the, with the gas and electric for the megawatts, their standard industry, and I, I would have to say it's the best interest for this taxable rate at, at 5,000 per megawatt. Okay. So um, the equipment obviously cost is probably quite expensive, right. conceivably, right? Do we know how much it costs to all this personal property equipment, like a value of it, say, on any one of the, I mean, are all of these relatively the same size and scope, or which one's the biggest? It depends. Um, I'm not oh. sure which one is the biggest, but, I mean, I, I'm only guessing it's one megawatt per, per site. And so that would be like a total of six megawatts. So the, all, all um, one, two, three, four, five of these are all the same size? Yeah, there's six parcels. Six parcels, but they're all the same size. I'm, I'm, no one has told me those yet, so I would not know. I, all I'm saying is I'm basing it on per megawatt and the change from residential to commercial property. That's what I've given you right okay. now. And you don't know what the personal property is valued at that's going on it, the, the cost of these? I don't. I don't have that information. I don't know how, how big those the solar fields are going to be. So, so isn't those kind of integral things to know before we're going to agree to waive those type of... Well, the federal tax credits are in place right now until the end of the year. So the building for these, for these parcels, I mean, it could cost... May, you know, it could cost between 500 and a million dollars for okay. the solar panels. So if it was personal property, we would have the commercial tax rate times a million dollars conceivably? Could be, yeah. So we're foregoing that to do 5000 a year? Well, we already set precedent for the, for the parcels. So, I mean... What do you mean? There's an ordin... Well, there's a uh, pilot program that's set up through the G&E and the city of Holyoke, so... Well, they did that once. That didn't come in front of us, I don't believe, did it? Well, I guess it is. Well, maybe, maybe well, we, well maybe we did, but you know, right. um, maybe we, you know, again, we can only base it on the information that we had at the time. That doesn't mean we once make a mistake. So that means I have to allow twenty years of mistakes. No, I, yeah, right. I, I agree so, with you, Kevin. so my question is, if the prop, we don't know what we're for. You know, when I agree an agreement, as you know. Offer, acceptance, consideration, right? What am I foregoing in lay you of what am I accepting, right? So I want to know what's alternative A, what's alternative B, and then I'll use my God given talents to determine which of the two is better for Holyoke. Problem is, I only know what proposal A is. I have no, I, I've been given zero data to explain proposal opportunity B, which is in any agreement. Oh, I have, Kevin. Okay. Then, then that answers the, then that, then that explains exactly where we're at at this time, which is we need more information. We need to understand if we don't do this, what, what could we potentially receive? Councilor Lisi. Thank you. Um, so as far as I understand, um, and perhaps at some point we should ask legal to, to chime in, um, we allow the use of so the use of solar fields, <coughs> solar power arrays on residential properties. 
we were dealing with this at the last committee meeting where um, Councilor Bacon is proposing that it's done by special permit as mm -hmm. opposed to by right. Yep. So we're not actually changing the zoning. It's still a residential zone that some of these solar arrays are being placed on. But what we can do under the state is charge them a tax rate at a commercial rate as opposed to residential without actually changing the underlying zoning. So, the, you know, yeah, I got that part. Yeah, so I, I, still, I don't understand why. I know where you're coming from. Kevin. My point is, Councilor Lisi, here, let me explain the distinction here. What my concern is that we're being said, forego all this personal property tax, forego all of this that you could potentially be getting, and in, in, in its place, agree to $5,000 per megawatt. Well, and I'm trying to discern if that is in the best interest of Holyoke. And I, I'm not quite sure we're at the point where we have sufficient data to, to do that analysis. Sure. I don't think that, I believe that when we accepted the um, Green Communities Act, um, we also um, accepted its provisions that said we cannot actually tax the um, solar array as personal property. And this is why we, we go through this pilot process. And this is where I would like to um, offer a suspension of the rules to see if um, Kara can talk more to that. Is there a second? On there? Aye. Aye. Kira, if you could answer a few questions. Thank you. So, Kara, the question, um, just to make it really clear, is um, I was under the impression that you can't actually tax the solar array as a personal property, which is what um, is being suggested here this evening. Um, I, I do apologize. I don't actually know. I, we these, um, the pilot agreements are based on the same ones that we've done for every project that has come through and they were, um, you know, negotiated by the gas and electric assessors and the mayor's office attorney pair in my office did review them, um, as well. So I would have to, you know, defer to Tony on those points. Um, I, I don't think that the tax parts of it were part of the green communities act that was in regards that was how the original solar ordinance was developed because there had to be um, certain provisions that you had to allow um, either green manufacturing or green energy by right. And so the ordinance and allowing the uses was part of the Green Communities Act, but the, the tax agreements were not. Okay, thank you. Under suspension of rules, if I could ask, when these pilot agreements come before us to be approved and ratified, <coughs> Are they coming to us as the last step? Yeah. Are they coming to us after the planning board has approved the permit and after yes. the assessors have determined the value? Yes. So it's not possible for this to be before us unless the planning board had approved the permit. And that's the process that we've followed because they're not gonna get to this point if they don't have the approvals. All, all these projects have been approved under the zoning ordinance through site plan review of the planning board. Okay. Because that wasn't clear in the... No, they all have been, and this would be the last step. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for um, Attorney Queen? Uh, Councilor McGivern? Kara, the pilot, or, or typically the gas and electric, and we've done it also with the geriatric authority over the years, um, is because the city owns the gas and electric, and the city owns the, the geriatric authority, as I've always stated. The pilot agreements were in lieu of tax agreements, you know, allowed through under the state, you know, as long as we were negotiated and both uh, parties are in agreement. But we're putting in lieu of tax agreements on private property here. And I, I think there's a difference here. And I think Kevin makes some good points. You know, is this the correct, the best formula for the city? Well, I mean, we, can, I can, we, can, we, can, we can revisit both ways if, if that's the... Uh, wishes of the, the council. But it would have to be well, a separate. My, my, yeah, my point is I'm not a necessarily opposed to a pilot. The point is it's got to be rationally related to what the actual regular taxes would be. This is a payment in layu of tax, right? That's what pilot means. So the question is what payment am I taking in layu of the tax? There's got to be some correlation that, well, if you didn't do the payment in lieu of tax, you know, you'd be entitled to $300,000, okay? Well, and then, but in exchange, oh, I'll give you five grand a megawatt, and the thing's going to produce a half a megawatt or, or 
or it'll produce two megawatts and you get a check for 10 grand when if you didn't do the pilot you would have got a hundred grand right. you know so now i just want to i just want disclosure here i want transparency so that counselors can say this is plan a this is plan b and this is what you're agreeing to but to just say everything that comes through is we flipped a coin and we came up with this number of 5,000 per every megawatt and that we're foregoing all any r rational relationship to what the regular personal property tax, what would be the regular commercial, because obviously once you're producing something off of the property, the land becomes worth more. Everything you know that's there becomes more valuable. A, an empty piece of land versus something that's generating. So I think once we get to that, then we can say, okay, well, it would have only been, you know, 15, but this is going to give us 10. Okay, not a problem, you know. I'd have to get formed, forms a list yeah, from each of the yeah. companies. I, I just think we need a little more problem. analysis. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think, you know, the whole point is, you know, we're, are we condoning a, a commercial use in a residential neighborhood? And, and you know the, the type of use should be taxed at a higher rate, but for example, if if we do a home occupation um, special permit for a residential home to exist within within the house itself, if 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 it needed or or if it makes sense, you can up the tax part of the house to commercial. But this body voted on allowing that use under a special permit in the overlay district. If we allow a business to move into a home on Northampton Street in that district, we can up the ante with the commercial rate on that. I mean, here th these are residential zones that all of a sudden solar fields uh, appear and, and and now we're saying, yeah, we're, we're in agreement by getting a commercial tax rate on them. I, I think we have to be careful on use. I think we have to be careful on how we, we go about this. You know, it, 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 I'm in agreement, but I'm not too sure procedurally if it's the correct way. And, and I think the uh, the importance of this is uh, for, you know, we're setting a precedent for the future. The precedent's not with the gas and electric. This is private property. This is new. This is not what we do with the gas and electric. This is brand new. Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with you on those points. We could tax them accordingly on the forms of lists if they were to provide forms of lists, build it, provide the form of lists under Chapter 59 for personal property. And then go from there, see what the tax taxes would go. But I'd have to have those forms of list from those companies. Sure. Councilor Sullivan, are you set? Yeah. Councilor Sullivan. Yeah, I, I think to um, tag on to what Kevin's getting at here also, we've got before us uh, coming up pretty soon, Gas and Electric uh, uh, trying to move very rapidly on getting a grant uh, through to produce. Uh, and it's a huge grant to produce only 1.7 megawatts. Uh, I think it's very overly optimistic to think that any one of these small individual lots would be generating one megawatt. I think the number could be quite a bit smaller. We're not going to realize any $5,000 out of it. Um, it's it's not Tony's venue to come up with that. I think these are numbers that's more than likely Holyoke Gas and Electric that's going to be having to. Uh, I, b I believe it's net metering uh, pay us back. They, they they should be able to generate some exact numbers as to what each one of these lots is going to produce so we can make a rational decision. That's to, to guess that it's going to be 5,000 or or whatever. That I, I don't see it given what's going on and the amount of funding going on for others that are going to produce barely more than that. So if if I can just in response to that, um, what is stipulated in the contract is the rate. Okay, so the rate says that it will be $5,000 per <clears throat> megawatt, and then it's prorated to the amount that is actually generated. I, so, to your point, um, I, I, the contract's I, kind of a generic contract that states what I, the calculation will be based on, but not what they anticipate it will be, except that. Tony did give us what the anticipated rate for that project is right. tonight. I'm not questioning the yep. rate as being fair. I'm questioning the amount that we right. can actually expect in revenue exactly. that, that it will actually generate. That's, exactly. That's, that's, that's numbers what, I don't have. 
I was, I was told by uh, Marcos that they're on average about a half a megawatt. So now you cut that in half. So that's fifteen. So twenty twenty five hundred bucks, right? It's like fifteen thousand for six for six parcels. Is there any other member of the committee or the council that has a question or a comment? What is the pleasure of the committee on this um, order? I would make a motion that it would be. Madam Chair, if I, if I could, I, I know one of the parties is represented here oh. this evening in the audience. Councilor McGivern. Just to bring it yeah. to your attention. I make to make a motion to suspend the rules to recognize Attorney Wilson. So, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Two things. First of all, Kevin, Attorney, I'm sorry, Councilor Jordan, to your thing, if this weren't in place, I don't think these properties would be built on. For example, the property on the end, we call it the clearing on the end of by where Councilor Bartley lives, that's been sitting for years. There's about $65,000 in taxes. So if this project were to come in, the city doesn't take it because it's one of those properties that it's not worth the city taking because there's nothing that can be developed on there. Mm -hmm. So in addition to the monies that would be spent, and I, I can show you pictures of that project, how that would look, and maybe that would help. I, I don't think I showed it to Tony, but that. So not only would you be getting you be getting something that hasn't had taxes, $65,000, whatever the tax will be by the time we close, that will be paid. In fact, my client has offered to pay that prior to, after getting approval prior to closing, just to get which, the money. Which one of the five or six? That is the one. property on, on our agenda the is Begley Mark. Lawler property. That's the last parcel. The last one, one okay. One, so, used to be the call the Lawler State so they're proposing to pay 65000 in back taxes. Whatever's owed, Kevin. On okay. the tax. Which you but approximately estimate yes. as. Okay. It, yes. Go ahead. Well, uh, I, and, think, I think he has some additional. And points. the other things on some of these properties, um, the property on Whitney, I mean, for example, I suppose that property on Whitney Avenue you could build a house on, but nobody's done that. Some of these, these aren't properties that have been taken because, you know, people have been in a bidding war. They're properties that, when they do these, that have been sitting there. So it's not like they look at a property and say, you know, we're going to outbid. Apple because they want to put a you know, factory on Forestdale Cemetery property or something like that. These are properties that are just sitting there. They, uh, these are deals made between private citizens. I understand that. In terms of the megawatts, it's my understanding that this is something that's been negotiated carefully, not only with the Hoya Gas Electric and SHR Energy, but all others over the state. And the the one megawatt, I understand that. A one megawatt, one megawatt is a value is something that they expect to make out of these. That's what I talked to. I spoke to John's Worko and Jim Lavelle, and I've spoken to my client, and that's what these figures are based on. I mean, it's not anything that was pulled out of the air. It's a it's an industry standard, from what I understand. And the other thing to understand is these aren't these are here now because as Tony said, not only is the federal tax credits leaving, but the state ones are. And um, Senator Ben Dowling from the Berkshires, who was, is one of the leading ones to try to get them get these extended, and he's leaving politics. So I, there was an article in the Globe the last time I was here, and there, I think there's an article in the Globe last week on the same thing, saying that there's a lot of, not that these things will be renewed and there may not be solar credits anymore. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what grant the gas and electric is getting from this, but the private solar is on its way out. So I, I guess what I'm trying to say is you can figure out, uh, Councilor Jordan, what you're doing, look, your question. However, in a practical world, nobody's planned to build on these lots. So you're figuring uh, maybe, but you know, right now you're getting zero, you're getting low rates and, um, my clients willing to invest on these lots, and if you were to do, if you were to charge the personal property rate, the, this wouldn't be done. It wouldn't be economically feasible. Okay. Um, I think the only thing I'll say in response to that is then um, we need to have more on the economics. We need to see a proposal. Uh, there is the only thing I can say certain about this proposal is its vagity. Uh, I, I wouldn't sign or agree to vote for this just based on the in specifics of what the two alternatives are. I don't rubber stamp things. And um, my job, I really, 
as much as I appreciate the two parties, whoever you're purchasing these properties from, and whoever your client is, um, and I hope everything works out wonderfully for those two involved, um, but I have really one person that I serve here, and that is the city. We need to ensure that the city is getting a fair and reasonable amount of taxes from these proposals. And the question is, we lack the data to determine if this analysis is reasonable. So if you would like to see this passed, then I think you should work quickly and vociferously if you think there's some sort of deadline to your tax credits with the assessor's office and provide them the information that they need so that they can do an alternative analysis and we can see what precisely the proposal is, what the taxes would ordinarily be in the absence of the pilot, and then what this proposal speaks to. We can then compare the two, and then you can say, well, why this is better is because nothing will happen on this side versus 2,500, and then I also have to think of, well, what's the potential for these properties otherwise in the future? Um, that there could be another another use for them besides solar fields because once they're gone to solar that's it forever on these properties effectively so I think that's what we need to do to make a really do our due diligence here and before we just I mean I'm not agreeing at this point and I don't think anyone here in this room has the information to say five thousand dollars a megawatt what is the substantiation to that number in these private transactions what what is your client going to receive for a megawatt of energy? How much will they be paid? They're selling it directly to Hoyle Gas Electric. They have no other client. For how much? Whatever that rate is. I, I think how much is a, that? I don't, I don't think it's a set rate. I think it goes as the market goes. Well, what's an average? I, I have no idea. It's okay, an then, then I, I want to have an idea. I, I want to make sure that the city is getting a fair deal here. So, and perhaps um, we should get the gas. You should have the gas and electric or come in here to explain because sure. they're the ones who negotiate that. John's work and Jim Lavelle. Okay. We it's it's not negotiated too. by the mayor. It's not negotiated. That's a we market. Have, we did have. Count, is, hang on, yeah. Councilor Bartley. Okay. Um, well, I don't want to interrupt. So, so Toby, thank you for coming by. Um, just on, uh, just clarify for me the the party um, over at the clearing. They, they want to pay the back taxes. Yes. And how do we know that? Because they've said that and that's the agreement we they have to in other words if they're gonna buy that property they have to pay the taxes off at closing don't they like in a regular real estate transaction they're gonna buy that property there's a purchase and sale between the Begley Lawler factions and my client where they would have to pay that off and it's contingent upon getting permits and approval so it hasn't closed yet then no absolutely okay not. so so let me just click so that party has not applied to the city of Holyoke for a solar permit. This so part, SHR Energy has. For S SHR Energy is the buyer of this property. But they don't own the property. No, but they they do it with the permits. Other, if they don't get the permits, they're not go through with the transaction. But I want to be clear. I mean, can, can the planning board give them a permit to a party that doesn't own, own the parcel? I've seen it done before. Permits, the owners of the property have signed on the, on the zone, on the, um, agreements, the planning permits and everything, was signed by the representative of the Lawler, the representative of Begley, and um, SHA Energy. Gary Rome, for example, Gary there Rome. are certain permits that are signed by the owner of the property, Jim Lavelle, the Gas Electric signed it, and Gary Rome signed it. It's There's places to sign in the, in the, for the owner and the applicant, sale. and if they're two different people. And they have a contingency agreement yeah, probably right. between them. Sale. And so the other thing that I'd like to offer for the committee is that each of these contracts states that the owner, the system owner, intends to develop an approximate 650 kilowatts. Right. So that is, e each contract the is the same. So 0.65 million. The amount is the same in each one. Okay. Okay. And the rate is the same in each one. I just had a chance to review them while we were talking. Um, and. As we're still under suspension of rules um, to Attorney Cunha, um, my understanding is that these have come before the committee to approve and ratify the agreement and that they've been drafted under whatever understanding we've had in the city. So I guess um, if you have any guidance to offer the committee as to if um, folks wish to pursue a path other than to accept these contracts, 
what we might do in lieu of that. So our guidelines, under the statute, it's the mayor that's specifically authorized to negotiate the agreements, mm -hmm. and it's the council's job to ratify them. So um, there's not a role for the council to negotiate the agreements. Right. Um, I'm not sure what else you're asking. No, that's it. That's really it. Um, and and I th under suspension of rules council. Yeah, just just on the rules piece because I I listened attentively at a few a past meeting. There was some concern regarding the tow contracts. Now, here is it the statute specifically say the city council must ratify the these because they're pilots. Is that why we're given authority? Pursuant to a specific statute, yes. Okay. Because I want to just distinguish between we were told at a prior meeting the city council can't get involved with contracts, Correct. but here there's a special carve out right. related. It's re I mean, it's like, yeah, it's required by statute. Okay. That it be I just required. want to make sure that we're on solid footing there. The only Councillor McGivern. But, Gary, I think Councillor Vacan's question is, is, isn't about the pilot agreement, it's about is the pilot agreement the correct mode the correct uh, procedure to use and, and we want more information as to why aren't we perhaps doing something different i mean i would have to have that information from the the, I don't think I the five you know not expecting the answer tonight but i, I think well, that's what we're asking to, they'd have to file a formal list and if i don't have a formal list i can't generate what the value is going to be so i mean I equipment the information yeah you know, I mean, I don't have that information. And as far as the, you know, you had uh, talked about market rate for generate megawatts. I mean, the coal plant was doing a rate for coal, and we see where that went. So, I mean, there was no there was no um, um, use for coal anymore. So they went down the tube. So we're just we're just looking for different ways to generate some money. Over the long haul, it might be more beneficial, but until I get a formal list, your question is a good question. It's a very good question. Thank you. So it seems we have a couple of paths to go on here. We can either approve and ratify these, or we can seek more information and table them. Or we could, we could, you could seek, you could, you could ratify, and then. As far as me, I could come back once I were to get the formal list, and then you guys could decide on which way to tax. Um, no, because if we ratify, we have to ratify Five this formula. formula. <coughs> All right. We, we can't, to my understanding, I don't believe we have the authority to modify the agreements, correct, Kara? Mm -hmm. It's either an up or down from our perspective. So the mayor has the authority to negotiate what the terms are. It's just we want to make sure that we're doing our due diligence. I'm kind of disappointed that the mayor already didn't ask for that information. How did he arrive at 5,000? Because we once in the G&E deal did it at 5,000 on public property, as Councilor McGivern adequately pointed out. So seems like those questions should have been answered before we ever got to this stage. But since that wasn't done, we'll help them. And so I, I would say that this should be tabled and we should wait two weeks. You give the, the, the information that you need. You, you make an excellent point about 65, there's an extra 65 grand, so that speaks to number six being a little bit stronger of a proposal right off the top. Maybe there's some other back taxes that are owed on the other ones, I don't know. But we should have full impact as to what Can what I ask we're, a what, question? Sure. If you're gonna do this in two weeks, perhaps you should have whoever from, and I don't know who negotiated with the I didn't negotiate for my client. That was done before I got involved. So perhaps the, perhaps those answers that you're asking for are kicking around somewhere in the other branch of government. I don't know. To, through so, the G&E, most, most of the pilot agreement was done through the G&E. For the Electric. Mueller Road and the right County Road. Yeah. And I will again I get, I mean, try I kinda, to get John's work I kinda, out. I kind of I kind of trust what the G&E did because over the long haul, you're going to have that constant, you're going to have that constant flow of income for years and years with no depreciation on, on the solar panels. Because after a while, those solar panels are going to be depreciated down to zero. They have about a 20 year life. Yeah. But, the, but again, the GE has I, nothing I to do a, with property. I have a counselor I, private property. in the queue. I understand that, but they, Folks. they were the ones who, who wrote just for the solar fields, 
We're not talking about the property. They're just for the solar panels. So this is about hang, property hang and on. use. Hang on, Councilor Bresnahan. I just have a, a question for anyone here that might be able to answer it. Um, I mean, does anybody, has anybody, do the neighbors in this neighborhood, and some of these are in neighborhoods, does anybody notify the, the residents that no. they're, they're going to plan on putting these large solar panels in someone's yard? No, they I do know, not. I, just, I know, but I mean, it's not like they're, it's not like you're building a house next door. They're putting up solar panels. That, it's a little bit different. I know when people are buying and selling land, nobody gets told, the butters don't get it told, but this is just a little bit different than building a house next door. They're building solar panels, and some of the folks on County Road have called about, I'm sure you've gotten calls about, <laughs> about the solar panels awful. at the cemetery. I know there's nothing we could do about it because it's private property, but I mean, there, there should be some sort of courtesy. Um, that they're notified that you know there's going to be a depreciation on your value. If, if you want to sell your house and move to Florida when you retire, somebody going to want to live next to solar panels? Right. But Council Bresnahan, the answer to your question is no. There is no notice because right now it's as of right, and that is what the public hearing is open in this committee and with the planning board on change to that. change that and put some limitations in the residential zone for the exact reasons that you just stated. The, the the way the way you could but, the, the way I mean if you didn't ratify this contract then the solar panels wouldn't be going there I'm assuming is that correct? Well, they say well, no, right. under I mean, so even under under suspension of rules in to, if we could get an answer to your question from Attorney Cunha relative to do these control the development of the solar field? Correct. So if there is no tax agreement, does it mean that the solar development can't go forward or are they mutually separate? They're completely separate. They've, as we said, they've all gone through site plan review under the current zoning ordinance through the planning board and site plan review follows special permit criteria. So butters within 300 feet, as far as I know, are notified of the planning board's public hearing and it's a public hearing oh, okay. and but so, I guess the question would be that is if the mayor makes the contracts and the council ratifies the contracts, if the council does not ratify the contracts, what happens to the solar panels, the deal of the solar panels on that property? It they've doesn't, been approved, so it would be up to the developer as to whether or not they go forward, but this has no impact on the, the project's been approved and is allowed. This is a financial term, so I don't... I don't know if Toby even wants to speak to that because it would be his client's decision, but this has no impact on whether the project goes forward. I mean, from a use standpoint, from a financial standpoint, maybe, but I don't even necessarily think that. Thank you for um, correcting on the notice to the abutters. So it's th within 300 feet, the right, abutters the are notified. Our, thank you. Yeah, our site plan follows the special permit. No, right, okay, right, right. thank you. Councilor McGivern. What makes them pay it? The use. Well, it's all the use. The property. What right does anybody have to do a commercial use in a residential zone without a special permit or a bona fide Because you, you have Chapter 59, which attacks according to use of the property. But this is about use, mm -hmm. not about pilot program. No, zoning, the zoning ordinance allows the solar development in any zone by right with site plan review. That's the That's problem. That's been done. My of the use it's a specific property so it's the use of the property so it's but a commercial use it's and but it's use in two separate contexts it's use in the context of zoning and use in the assessor's world of how they classify property and those two are not always the same and these agreements it's chapter 59 30 it's, it's, it's not a residential property it's not a it's not a <laughs> one family one house one one it's a commercial one. property that live next door to them. Oh, they're not, no required to the the These are residential properties. They're residential, but they would switch to a commercial property. She just said that. By site plan review only. No, by I'm my by my inspection of the use. The chapter 59 is according to use. Each parcel is taxed according to use. Okay, so if, if I open up a convenience store in my home, you're going to come up to me and start taxing me commercial. And my neighbors are going to be fine because you're taxing me commercial. Um, Councilor Lisi, that's my question. You would get charged. How are they allowed by right? From that, have to go through the zoning. 
So I have a question about the um, contract. So um, Attorney Wilson, if you, do, if you don't mind coming to the microphone again. Um, <coughs> so the, the contract is between your client and the g and &E, right? And then the, the pilot is between whom? Yeah, Toby, to the can you use the microphone? This is being televised. It's between the system owner, SHR Energy in this case, and the City of Holyoke under the authority of Mass General Laws, Chapter 59, Section 38 HB. To It's an agreement for pay. This is in, a lieu, an, in lieu of tax agreement is basically what this is. Mm -hmm. So like the churches have had and all the other people have had in lieu of taxes, like nonprofits had for years. That's what this is. It's basically, it's an in lieu of tax. So in the brief research that I've done while sitting here, um, it basically says that um, municipalities should only be enter entering into pilot agreements with a generation company. And I think that we're having this pilot agreement essentially through the GNE because the GNE is going to be the generation company, right? I think my your, client your, generates the power, the gas and electric buy is the vendor, right. is the purchase, purchases the power. It's an exclusive purchase. In other words, I think my client sells to the, directly the Hoyle Gas and Electric. They generate through the solar. The gas and electric is the, who buys the power from them. Yeah, and I think this is what qualifies them for the pilot. Right. Because otherwise, private, private property owners of solar fields um, don't necessarily have the authority to enter into a pilot agreement for um, PV installations. Um, and then earlier in this document that's provided by environment.law.harvard.edu um, asks, you know, are solar um, PV installations real or personal property? And it gives a very um, broad definition of how to classify personal property versus real property. And it says, polar, um, sorry, solar installations can go either way. Um, however, there are precedents in place that if the Solar PV installations could be properly classified um, as real property um, if the machinery and equipment um, are intended to remain on the site for the entirety of their useful life. So I think that gets us into the, the debate as to whether it's going to be classified as real or um, personal property. <coughs> just the answer, just in discussions with everybody I've been involved in, it's my client's position that he has to pay the per, the real property tax under the commercial rate, and he would pay a personal property tax. And this agreement is again, and in lieu of a tax agreement, like nonprofits have had, colleges have all over, and things like that. So it's just that's what he's entering into, and I think that's the carrot to get them to develop solar panels in properties. Thank you. I think we've exhausted the discussion at the moment. If there is a motion, I would entertain a motion. I make a motion that be tabled uh, until our next meeting, and hopefully the proponent will have an opportunity to speak to the assessors and give them the information vis-a-vis uh, -vis $65,000 payoff of taxes on one of these, all of the information that the assessor's office would require to do a complete analysis, and then uh, we retake this up at that time once we have complete information. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Under suspension of rules, I would entertain a motion to take up three to six as a package. Second. Yep. All in favor? Aye. 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 Table. Second. Motion to table. Second. I just do need to stipulate that these are solar pilot agreements similar to the one we've discussed at length. All in favor of Aye. tabling? Aye. 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 Item seven. Do I have a motion? Uh, motion to take it up off the table. Second. All in favor? Aye. This order was filed by Councilor Jourdain that an ordinance be created requiring the mayor to submit a balanced budget for the subsequent fiscal year by the city council to the city council by April 30th of each year. 
The mayor's budget proposal for expenses may not exceed the projected revenues for the subsequent fiscal year. The mayor may not use uncertified free cash dollars or unapproved withdrawals from the stabilization fund in his revenue estimate to provide a balanced budget for the subsequent fiscal year. To the maker of the order, Councilor Jourdain. <clears throat> Thank you. I did ask that this go on the agenda for the evening for a brief discussion. Um, just a quick sort of colloquy with the law department. I know you had certain opinions about this. Is there, I was hoping that you could give us some framework that you felt might be acceptable even, you know, for those portions of the process that you feel that we might be able to, to do, if anything, um, with regard to an, an ordinance that goes around um, either explaining or talking about when the mayor submits the budget um, and I know some of this is codified already in state law, but my concern is that I would like to get to a point where we have a balanced budget come July 1st, as opposed to um, January 1st, subsequently six months later. And so my question is, is there any ability to put in restrictions um, to do that, which is sensitive to some of the points that you made at a prior meeting? Um, in this area and and if you're not really prepared to speak to that you know we could just continue to have a dialogue about that um, for a future meeting because I would like to work up um, whatever level of restrictions that we can put um, I'm sensitive to the fact that the mayor says you know he wants to to do this better and, and whatnot but by the same token um, the process that we have right now is extremely dysfunctional and is not working in the best interests of taxpayers. Yeah. And as a result, we're coming up with not balancing our budget until January, six months into the fiscal year. And, and as a result, um, I would like to be sensitive to the mayor's authority, but at the same time, um, work to create a better process. And so I just kind of wanted to maybe, yeah. And I know it's a it's a weighty subject. It's a wide subject, and we may not get into, you know, I'm, the devil's going to be in the details. I'm sure. So. Well, I th I mean I think last time I pretty much went through my opinion. You know that state law dictates um, the budget process, mm -hmm. and I think I you know I was looking back at my notes before this meeting. I think the questions the committee had were really more questions for the auditor. Um, okay. I think there have been a number of questions about. Um, the revenue, how it comes in, what, how, uh, essentially how the revenue estimates, when they come in, how they come in, how that's used to develop the budget, and those are frankly just not answers that I have. Sure. <laughs> that's not sure. part of my purview. So uh, uh, that was where I, you know, okay. what my notes were, and so, uh, you know, I, if it's looking at the process, I think that is a discussion with the people who are more intimately involved with that process, which is not Sure. myself it's sure. the auditor the mayor's office the treasurer's office that develop the budget that know um, you know what the revenue sources are how those are governed so are there I, any I, restrictions if we wanted to put on their limits um, on when and can we make requirements of the auditor to to provide us various estimates um, and fund balances and projections can we build in a timeline uh, for that type of information, or is that also governed in by state law? I mean, I would, again, that would be a question. I wouldn't even know where to begin. The, you would have okay. to, it'd be a conversation with the auditor as to what okay. those specific revenues are, a, a lot of the time frames of when they're made available and how those calculations are done are governed by state law, so. Okay. All right, so we'll, we'll continue. I, I would support tabling at this point. I'll continue to work with Carol. I'll also talk to Bellamy some more, and uh, we'll pick this up at another meeting. Second. All in favor? Thank Aye. you. So. Thank you. Can we take up 8, 9, and 10 as a package? Make a motion to take up items 8, 9, and 10 as a package. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So item eight was filed by Councillor McGee. 
order that the city proceed with a bid process regarding the replacement of the city's outside legal counsel. The bid process can potentially offer cost savings to the city, look to attract local firm and keep the process open and fair. Item nine, filed by Councilor Bartley. To strengthen the procurement laws, the city of Holyoke will put police ordered towing and any other public towing services out to bid on at least a biennial basis. 10, filed by Councilor Jourdain, ordered that Division Three entitled Purchasing Department of Chapter Two of the Code of Ordinances be reviewed and amended as necessary for consistency with the threshold set by Mass General Law Chapter 30B. So, um, Councilor McGee not being here, Councilor Bartley being out of the room, <laughs> Councilor Jourdain. We also have um, some packets of legal language regarding purchasing. Oh yeah, thank oh, you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Kara, I think we're, I think we're going to need to suspend the rules to probably have the law department address us regarding this, an explanation of the requirements of 30B, what we're doing now, what does the state law allow? There's been a suggestion by the uh, school department that Holyoke's being more restrictive than what state law requires, and then we can have a discussion as to why and is this good or bad. So, so do I have a second on suspension of rules? All in favor? Aye. So moved. And also to include Dave Martins, obviously, too, to speak as well. Um, I'll, uh, we'll I'll suspend the rules to also allow Dave Martins to, to speak. All in as favor? Well. Thank you. Okay. Thank and you. If you have another copy, I don't I'll think Dave you you had a copy. Of, I put them all up there. Um, I mean, I'm, ha I'm happy to start and Dave, I know Dave will jump in where, but I, what, just briefly what you have in front of you is, is a couple extras? I can give the other counselors. there should have been a couple. I gave one to that side, but oh, and that's, a, that's something else. something else. Okay. All right. Thank there you. There is a chart and this, there's two parts to it. Oh, here he is. That's one part. Oh, okay. Thank you. I don't know, there should be it should be a few extra copies. Do they need a chart? Do you need a chart? So the chart just quickly, the chart is a comparison of our city ordinance versus chapter thirty B. Um, and essentially I think when the ordinance was originally written, it mirrored the language of the statute, but then since that time, there's been many changes to the statute, and so the ordinance is no longer um, consistent with it, and so that does create, obviously, some issues, um, which the school department has has brought to Councilor Jordan's attention, and I think all of, all of our attentions. I mean, briefly, the biggest areas where there's inconsistencies is the exceptions. Um, there's only 14 that are included in the ordinance and the statute has 34. And then the amounts between the ordinance and the statute, um, which I highlight underlined within the chart so you could see basically um, our ordinance, it, so it's the amounts and the procedures you have to follow based on the amount of the contract. Our ordinance is that if it's a thousand dollars or less you use sound business practices the state law is ten thousand dollars or less um our ordinance is for between a thousand and ten thousand it is quotations the state law is ten thousand to thirty five thousand for quotations and then our ordinance is ten thousand or higher requires competitive bidding or proposals and the state law is now thirty five thousand can i just ask a question so I read the um, communication from Dr. Zreich relative to this, and the question I was left with was sound business practices and what that would include. Because while I'm in favor of being able to get things done more quickly and more efficiently, I just want to make sure that we have documentation for these expenditures, especially if we're going to increase them tenfold. I'm not saying I think it's unreasonable. It's just that what would be the sound business practices and would we include those in the ordinance? Well, if, and then I'll let Dave answer because I think he can speak better. But yeah. um, 
I mean, basically, this is another situation where, in my opinion, there's no need to have an ordinance that just reiterates the state law, but you are allowed to be more stringent. So the only area the ordinance really needs to address in order to avoid future conflicts like this where you constantly have to change your ordinance to match the law is to say, and, and that's part of what I've redrafted, is to say that everything's going to be done in conformance with 30B. And you're not going to include specific amounts that's because, this. yep. I mean, tomorrow the state legislature could make it $35,001, and now you need to come back and change it. Um, but as you see in regards to those other orders, if you do want to be more stringent, those can be included. Um, so the statute defines sound business practice as ensuring the receipt of favorable prices by periodically soliciting price lists or quotes. But I'd let Dave address probably more how practically okay. <laughs> that's done. Thanks. I think you hit it right on the button. Sound business practice is just opening up the decisions that you're giving off. So, and he should be or she should be looking out at the market to see what's out there, what's not out there. The only drawback to any of this is exactly what you said: is if we go up to thirty-five thousand, where's the checks and balances as to are we getting a better price? My other concern is yes, I support it, it, it I think it would expedite items. And it's not something so $35,000 coming to me, I award a contract. It's still supposed to have three quotes right. attached to that in writing. And I think that's important. The department has to understand. They just can't go out and spend 35000 and, and come back and right. get a contract. I think the other issue, too, is uh, will it speed it up? I guess it will. I mean, I have no problem with doing this ordinance or change. I like the way that the attorney said it's doing according to whatever the laws of the procurement is. We follow suit because that way it eliminates a lot of headache. Mm -hmm. The new person that comes in, you can set up a yearly meeting with him or her and go over how things are going and everything else. But yeah, I'm not objecting to this. I think the school department is just trying to do things better, I guess. I mean, the only caution would be is how do we get to that $35,000? So you would support the idea that we would have some language that required written quotes. Oh, no, that's the language in that's the already law. Oh, that's already the Anything language. Anything one thousand uh, zero to five is that's your basic good common sense uh, procurement. Meaning at five thousand dollars, if I think the market does that, I just said go ahead. Now what it will say is between zero and ten thousand, it would be good judgment on the market. Between ten thousand and thirty-five, it still requires you get three written bids okay. or quotes. The only difference is, is when you get those, they're not sealed. So they could fax it over to you and everything else. And it, it all boils down to is you have to trust people that they're going to follow the law and keep good records, okay? That's the name of the game. Thanks. Care, oh, can I go? Councilor Jardine. Oh, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Kara. Thanks, Dave. Um, and, I, and I thought it's really important Dave's here tonight because, you know, Dave is is – you know, really the, our resident expert on all of our procurement stuff. He's kept us out of trouble for years and years, and I just want to thank, first of all, publicly thank you for a great career. You. Uh, you've been an outstanding public servant, and every year you've been up, every time I've always been proud to support you, and uh, I know we're going to be losing you soon to uh, retirement. That's not for public record. I'm not sure where you heard that. that I was oh, okay. <laughs> thought I heard it from you five minutes ago. Oh, but uh, said, <laughs> Oh, the new person. Maybe a year from now. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. All right, very good. Don't okay. jump the gun. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I just wanted, I thought it was very important that we have all of Dave's input on this. So anyways, Kira, um, just walking us through, and I'm sure at some point we'll get to, oh, maybe this already is, the strike through language. Um, I'm a little, I, I just want to kind of walk through some of these buckets, it looks like the bulk of them are on the first page. Right. I get the dollar limit changes, but um, some of the things like the exemptions, uh, you mentioned that the state law has 34 exemptions, whereas our current law has 14. Some of these being things like, you know, outside legal counsel, which I think is the subject of Councilor McGee's uh, proposal. Uh, ambulances, thing, ambulance service, all, a, a number of these type of things. Can you just kind of walk us through, like, w what would be really substantively changing on some of like those? Like, is um, uh, like, what do we exempt now versus like? Well, what? 
and again, I think this is just, I don't necessarily think this was a substantive decision. I think it was, um, our ordinance was probably adopted. And then I'm just looking at the, the changes to section one of 30B, which has the exemptions, has been amended since 1989. It's been amended at least probably like 20 times, and we've never kept up with making those amendments. So could we in, in the current ordinance, can you just point me to the um, exception language now? So it's in 2-3. I mean, I can read them or I'm happy to say. Well, no, no, just you. if you could just point me to it, I could kind of thumbnail through it. Uh, actually, it's you don't have it because I oh, okay. didn't do it with the whole. It was, it was too complicated okay. <laughs> to All do. Right. And okay. it was too long. <laughs> Two dash three three four. Oh, I see. Okay, so this is going to be a, some section on sole source procurement or some of these things. Is that it? Um, I mean, so what the comments kind of explain. I mean, basically, it's taking and would be deleting a lot of what our current ordinance is, and just creating one section that says everything's going to be done in accordance with thirty B. Um, and then adding, because from my review, the only provisions that are more stringent are some of these that you want to go out to bid rather than being exempt. So it would be adding in, back in those particular contracts um, and just stating that everything else. And then leaving in, we also, for example, have our own section on real property disposition and acquisition. We would keep that the same and I would propose um, adding in there the other order about notification yep. to abutters that uh, is on your agenda. Yep. Um, I mean, so, I can do a, a red line version. It's just our current ordinance is probably a good 20 pages long. Let me just it's, add one quick comment. You have sure. to understand that this was signed back in 1970. Yeah, that's. Uh, <laughs> so we never, at the time, 30B was not in place. 30B came in the 80s. So I think all we're saying now is time to update oh, yeah. the books. And the biggest issue I have at all is the contract issues because we got $5,000. Can't buy nothing with $5,000. So I'm sending contracts out that require seven signatures. And one of the issues is the, co the vendor can't begin the process with all, these, without all the signatures. So by raising that even to 10000 or fifteen would make my life a lot easier. Oh, good. Okay, and that's and we want and, and I'm glad that we're having this conversation. If it's not too much of a hardship, I would like a full red line version because I, you know, I the meticulously on the details. I mean, I, I do actually read all that stuff, and um, but I, you seem to say this is efficient. The school department wants it, and these are the folks that are doing it day in and day out. So I'm I'm on board for me personally for the different dollar limit changes. It seems reasonable. But some of these other things I would like to go into, if we can be more restrictive, maybe there's some things we want to be more restrictive on since, you know, we have that authority. Yeah, I mean, that that's completely up yeah. to you. Yeah, Just... yeah. Okay. And we can have that discussion. We'll, we'll bang through it and then go bing, 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 you know, what we, what we feel is best. So, all right. Thank you. Yep, excellent. Um, Councillor Bartley was out of the room when we took these up as a package, so I'll keep Councillor Sullivan in the queue, but I'd like to let Councillor Bartley speak to his order. Well, just, just to the point of order, so on, on Councillor McGee's order, uh, what's, what's, the, what's the plan for, for that, if I may, at, at this point? Are we... Uh, okay, so... so, so, so We're just... Right, okay, we just okay, so, okay, so, so Councillor McGee has an order, number eight, uh, relative to outside legal counsel, and, and he wanted to no longer make that exempt. Uh, Per, per 30B, I had a, I had an exact same order to, to that effect in ordinance, um, and, and we gave a leave to a draw a month ago because I knew this order was still in here, and just to clear out the jacket. But um, so uh, I mean, I'll I'll sign my name onto the, this uh, onto Todd's order um, right now. 
Um, and so that is under Mass General Law 30B, Section 1A, Section 5, you know, Paragraph 15, the uh, getting legal counsel is not subject to public bid. Exactly the same way with um, police ordered tows are not subject to state bid. So, so the chair would like me to speak on, on this and I'll, and I'll be fairly brief, but I do have a couple notes that I just wanna make sure I touch on. So just, just bear with me for a minute, Madam Chair. When you, if I can just interrupt, yes. when you took this up last time, you did ask for draft language and in the marked up version I gave this, you, it is there. It would be listed as additional contracts subject to competitive bidding or proposals. Um, and what number? It uh, one. Oh, it's on the yeah. legal counsel. Yeah, so this, the other this. one. Nope, the one you had. What, which other one, uh, Carol? No, the marked up. Yeah. What's now two dash three thirty four subsection D D. Right on the okay, first page. Right on the first page. Yeah. Additional con so notwithstanding provisions of Chapter Thirty B mm -hmm. or any other law prior to the award of any of the following contracts, the purchase purchasing director shall publicly request competitive bids, proposals, or qualifications. Um, and there's the two that you took up last time: the ambulance service mm -hmm. and uh, outside, outside counsel. legal counsel. Oh, thank you for pointing that out. Sure. And and I just think. From a clarity standpoint, it would make sense to keep these all together and incorporate them right. into the eventual revision. Right. Thank you. And if and just um, one more point, I'll send all of you the full list of all the exemptions that are in the state law. Okay. And so and so, Kara, I'm I'm not prepared to vote on this this tonight, especially because the maker of the order, I I would like to get his thoughts on this. Now we've had two meetings on this, and and I'm hoping that. That the maker of the order, though I joined it tonight, will will come by and, and give us his thoughts um, as as to how we'd like to proceed. Well, um, no. you, in my you asked for some additional. Yeah, yeah. we've asked. I want to. I would like to <laughs> compare the list of the fourteen exceptions versus the state thirty-four exceptions, and then there's two in the current draft. We may want more. Well. We may want we more, have the towing more, order. May, may want more what? Well, I believe you have a proposal. Have number, a, I believe you have a proposal number nine on our agenda. We have a, right. So we may want to add in more. Right? Oh, I agree. I, I agree. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right. I, I was. I was just just really asking a question. I didn't know the, what you're saying. Um, so it. And so that's the same way with with police ordered tows and and. Uh, and so it's exempt under 30B, and you know it's the same section, whatever the subparagraph is, it doesn't matter, but it's it's in there. Um, I, th I think it's paragraph 20, 21. 21. Okay, so just be super technical. So there it is. Um, it's also noteworthy in there that that uh, contracts for snow plowing are, are also exempt from from 30B. Um, so I'll I'll just say that for the record. So the reason I I kind of brought this up is is not for any one vendor or any one business is just to to me it's to make a fair process and and so and I'll, when we go through this when we and I, and I see Kara's draft here but it's 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 uh, I, I would hope that when we when we update our our ordinance to make the procurement law stronger that we just don't simply say a contract to retain general outside legal con con Council um, is is uh, accepting engagement, especially council is is uh, is now subject to competitive bids because uh, I would want us to have the ability, um, Madam Chair, um, to to sort of really hone in on what we're driving at here. So yes, we want outside we want the stuff bid because um, we want to get the biggest bang for our buck, but we also have a sensitivity. I hope. To Holyoke businesses, I, I hope there's a sensitivity in there. So I hope in our language, not that we're micromanaging the procurement office, uh, purchasing office, but I'm I'm hopeful that we can come up with some kind of language that will allow. Oh, hold my calls. Um, that we will allow some kind of some kind of uh, uh, 
not full preference, but some kind of hope, uh, Dave, that we can um, Go in the allow Holyoke businesses to Go effectively compete and, in fact, maybe have an, even have a slight advantage in some cases. So a Holyoke lawyer, a Holyoke accountant, um, a Holyoke... Uh, to, to address that very quickly, I have been doing that since... Dave, put the mic on. It's on. Well, talking to it. Move maybe I'm here. not talking loud. Right, That's thanks. something different than my voice. Uh, we, I've been doing that right along when it comes to like printing. You won't see any of my printing going out of town. We've got a, a few printing houses in town. By raising this level, we may be do, able to do a little bit better with the Hoyle vendor. The problem with the Hoyle vendors, I cannot give them an advantage because state law don't allow you to do that. We've discussed this issues five times if we discussed it once about giving the city of Hoyle a 5% uh, waiver. I'm all for it. They pay my salary, uh, they pay your stipend, and they are a taxpayer in Holyoke. I don't know how to get around that, but that's up to uh, the law department to figure out. The other issue, too, is, and I noticed, David, you brought up a good point, is how do we write the specifications? You're going to have issues that if I write up a specification that says A, B, and C, there's going to be challenges that I don't have B or I don't have C and I don't have A. So again, we have contract this from day one that we had it where the vendor paid the city of Hoyoke of each toe. The problem was the bad cars, they didn't want. So now we're stuck with these out on the street. So it's not as easy as that as just say competitively bid. I can't address the law department. I do know that if I'm going out for the attorney, what am I going out for? So those are issues that when we start discussing it, I'll be happy to come back. We have to be careful how the specifications are done. Well, I mean, it, I, I say I don't know how to speak to a towing right now, but attorneys, I mean, you can go out for lots of lots of things, price, uh, expertise. Um, so there's, I think there's lots of them. So, um, and, then, and then if we if we do change the ordinance for any of these existing contracts, so for example, we just received the, the copy of the towing contract, and thank you, Attorney Cunha, for providing those. Uh, we know from re reviewing those contracts for, for, for towing vendors that they expire um, on or about December 31st, 2017. But in those contracts are provisions that they can be renewed by the city. So we would want to make sure in our ordinances that those con that any renewal um, any, any renewal in, in, the, in, the, in the current contract is, um, is, is waived. So I, I, I would... I, Say that again. I don't think we could do. I mean, the, any changes in the ordinance aren't going to apply to existing. Well, so it, but, but the ordinance would supersede an existing contract. I don't think so, but which I think would be opening ourselves up to being sued by the contractors. But but it says renewed by the city. It's not renewed by the contractor. Right. So we're making it clear that the city's not going to renew that contract after it after it expires at the end of 2017. How is that a problem? I will have to look into that, but Great. I'm just saying I don't Okay, well I I, no, I appreciate that. I I'm, I I want to do it right, but that's that's And the I'm ordinance just, generally the, is the, not the, gonna... the chair the chair is well, hold on a second. Just so you know, you'll you'll get your turn. So the, the the chair just wanted me to give my points. So that that's all I'm doing simply right here. So we're we're not making the law. We're just giving giving my two cents and why I filed the order. That's all. So, um, okay. So um, th those those are those are the main points. Thank you, Councilor Jourdain. Oh yeah. You trying to get my attention? Um, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> You're such a pal. Um, so, anyways, um, the other end of the pendulum. Um, I also hear what the law department said also. Um, I'm generally supportive and have been for some time about these contracts, especially people that are going to retainer and have these long time engagements with the city. But I do think you did make a good point, Kara, about you know you get served with a, with a, a complaint. You have 20 days to answer the complaint. I would expect that you would build some emergency language into this for our consideration so that um, yeah, is it for specialized, right? Engagement yeah. of specialized counsel for a specific case. Okay. All right. Okay. Accepting the engagement of all right. And we you talked about that last time. 
I, yeah, I, and that's where I, I certainly I have no problem with in the event we enter into, I think I said last time, a long-term contract um, to do an RFP, and that certainly would be the goal because it would be a more generalized, well, even if it was for some a specialized longer-term contract, that's no problem, but um, it's just not practical to think that any kind of case comes in and it has right. to be answered that we're going to go out to bid. So. Right. You wouldn't have enough time. Um, now, okay, now seeing this language and the way this is worded, um, I think it's important to go now to go the other extreme, which is I don't want you to use that exception overly to the, I mean, if you have a case and you're going where it's, here comes complaint, you're filing, you go and sure. get somebody. But on the other hand, Theoretically, every case is its own individual case, and the exception could define the rule, if you see what I'm no, saying, I understand. right? Yeah. yeah. So we just want to be careful that we don't overly game the exception. Not to say you would ever do that, but I'm just saying I want to, we have to write these rules for all of posterity. So, uh, okay, great. Right, because I would note that I think we've been doing more in house in the last two years than we had prior. Mm -hmm. Right, and if, I mean, if there was a, a more generalized long-term contract, then that also probably would be handling m most of the cases that come in, so. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, uh... Oh, Councillor Sullivan? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mr. Martins, um, can you tell me, uh, as far as the um, uh, using sound business practice on the, the award of some of these, uh, we mentioned uh, they'd still be required to go out and get three competitive bids. What, what if on some of these smaller contracts there's really only one person or two entities when, uh, interested? When, when I say it's usually if it, everything goes the way, it's, uh, hopefully it'd be ten thousand dollars would be sound business, and that's yes. If I only had one, I always says is I have to seek three prices. Doesn't have to say I received three prices. As long as I can document it that I received from A, B, and C. A and B did not respond, C did. I should clarify, sole source is not really a bit odd exemption because there's nothing like a sole source. It tells you right in the, the procurement laws. You can't claim a sole source over 35,000, that's what it reads now, is because you're supposed to go out there and at least check the market. So I've been trying to jam that into people's head in the, in the school department and everything else. So there are catch and balances, but yes, anything under that, that thing, it's a judgment on the, the procurement office or whether or not. In consultation, of course, with the department, uh, which we work hand in hand. And I'll let you finish it because I have another comment at the end, if I may. So would that also apply to the disposition of surplus uh, properties of the city also? So the, the surplus of... Uh, uh, property is strictly under uh, state law, under procurement, which it says anything under 35. I keep sort of not the, the figure now, but it was different. Uh, today is different because it's up to $10,000 or $5,000 for surplus material. That will change if we go to the 30, uh, the new changes, then it becomes $35,000 that the city has the right to dispose of in the best way they can without a formal bid. I need to emphasize formal bidding and regular bidding. The only difference is when it's over that $35,000 mark, you have to advertise it. You have to have sealed bids and you can't just have it faxed in. So the other bids can be, well, be in my office at <coughs> five o'clock with your bid, or at least sometimes today. That's the real difference, but it still has to be in writing. Okay, I'm, I'm not trying to okay. put anybody on the spot. I'm looking at some other alternatives to some stuff we're doing around uh, disposition of properties and demolition. Uh, an example That's, here would there's be... There's a separate ordinance on the real property. There's a whole section. Okay, and it's not covered in this? It's... It's covered it in the law, but it's under a whole different section of the law. And we have our own ordinance that governs disposition right. of properties through auction or under 30B through an RFP. Yeah, that's fairly recent. It should be included in the draft. It's in there. Okay, so I'll give an example here. We, we're, we're faced with what to do with the armory coming up. And if we had somebody interested in acquiring the slate off of that roof, myself, I've been in that section of business for quite a while. 
there's only one or two real buyers of slate in the entire Northeast. Would it pro is there something that prohibits the city from going out and entering into arrangement before the thing falls into the cellar hole? Well, I've heard that that system there, and it would be a difficult thing to do for the simple fact that you're only getting the slate and what happens to the rest of the building. I would assume part of the contract would be that you'd need to tear it down. All the demolitions we do, consider it once we award the contract, it's your material. But if you wanted the Army to slate, your bid has to include the demolition of the building. What you do with that slate is not our concern. If you have Jim Smith over here buying it, you can sell it on your own because you become owner of that property until it's demolished, or that building, I should say, not the property, until it's demolished. Okay. Okay. Councilor Lisi? Um, thanks. Um, Dave, for the sound business practices, um, if it's under the $35,000 mark, if we move to the new um, 30B um, structure, the three, the three market rates, does that require a bid or can it just be you investigating three, it, three rates? Sound business <laughs> practice will only apply to things over $10,000. Right now it's at five. After that it goes up to ten, and from ten thousand above, mm -hmm. you have to have the three written quotes at the ten to thirty-five thousand mark. But those are not. They're not. My question is really. They're not bids. You don't have to actually seek bids. They just have to be quotes. They don't. It doesn't yeah, have to be a yes, competitive yeah, they process. They don't have to be sealed bids. That's yeah. correct. Yep. Okay. Great. Thanks. Councilor McGivern. David, when it comes to the value of a towing contract, it would be the value to the the holder of the contract, correct? So towing contracts would far exceed $35,000? Uh, yeah, with the person that has it that's getting paid for all the tows, I'm going to assume that. I don't have records on that. Well, if, if you were to be involved with a towing contract or with any contract, you would look for records to yes. assess the value of a contract. Yes. So under 30B, are you allowed to do that? Oh, yeah. Because I think the towing contracts are got to exceed thirty-five thousand five times oh, yeah. over. Mm -hmm. The only reason I haven't quarter been, million. The only reason I haven't been involved in it is because it's exempt under thirty B. Right. And we have been involved in the past under that towing contract, and I well, leave it to the new person. Okay. How do we know there's a new person? I don't. Know there's been no announcement about that. The wife is calling me in the ear here, so <laughs> she might be saying something different. Every uh, Councilor Sullivan. Yeah, a uh, uh, towing contract doesn't involve any revenue for the city. Right, right, I'm sorry, not any expenditure for the city. That's correct. No. Yeah. No. Do we have a we have a uh, receivable? Because <coughs> if you if I get my car towed, I'm paying twenty dollars for that release notice. Right, but that has nothing to do with the no, contract. Once that car is picked up, it belongs to the tow company. So is that why it does, is that one reason that it doesn't go out to public bid? I I could have, I have no idea why it doesn't come. That comes down from Boston, and what they think in Boston is probably a little different than what we okay. think here. And Kara, could it, could a contract be written where there there is a um, payment to the city <coughs> with with each tow job? If I may address that just for a quick second, and I apologize. I no, didn't mean to interrupt you, but if you do that. Then it becomes an issue of when is the city being paid? After that car is picked up or before the car is picked up? One of the arguments been in the past is that they don't get paid from the tow from the people that own the car. Why are they paying us for that tow? And who's going to maintain those records on what is picked up and what's not? And it ended up in the past where the towing firm picked up only the good cars and that ones they knew they were going to get their, their money back on. And that's the more difficult part of the, the city receiving. What we did, and I'm going to guess 15 years ago, 20 years ago, we had the uh, $20 fee, actually it was $10 fee to release the car back to you. That's where the city made its money. Everything else was went to the towing company. And the, the rates of the tow companies charge are set by statute. And I think Dave, to a little bit further on Dave's point, their remedy is they can keep the car and then sell it. Well, yeah, it. They, they can scrap it or auction it. No. So uh, I don't see why they wouldn't take any car, no matter what 
kind of a piece of junk it is, even at today's low scrap rates, it would it would bring a sizable profit for whatever towing company has it. So it, in my mind, it would be incumbent upon the towing company uh, to be paying, you know, if there was such a arrangement to be paying the city for each tow. There, there seems to be a huge profit in this with, with no benefit for the city aside from the uh, small uh, stipend collected by the police department. I mean, we could, I would have to look into that. Um, I think, like Dave said, it's a matter becomes a matter of of collections. I mean, it's a service that we need to have, and if we're not gonna provide it ourselves, um, you know, it, it's very similar to an ambulance contract. That it's a service that we have to have, and that that's probably also part of the reason why it's exempt is that. Um, you always the police always need to have a tow company available and you can't be waiting necessarily waiting for it to be put out to bid in the time that that takes um, we did I would have to go back and look at how other communities have it structured and see if anybody else charges those kind of fees but then it becomes an administrative additional burden on the city of collecting those Prior to the next meeting, I'll meet with a couple of tow, tow companies, especially the ones in Hoyoke, to see if that's feasible and come back with a, a, a better report for you. Because quite honestly, like I said, is I haven't been in it a while. I, I can't answer how much it's worth, but I'll be happy to work and come back with a report so you have a better basis for your decision. Thank you. Okay. If everybody's been heard on this for now, I'd entertain a motion on this. What I'm hearing is we're looking for information on the current exemptions for our next meeting yep. and Dave will bring us some further information. So it seems that a motion we're to table. Have, and we're also going to get a uh, red line version yep. from okay. Kara. Yeah, so a red line version, exemptions. And Dave, what were you planning on doing? And what's the, uh, what would be the best result of us taking a fee from the tow company? Okay. I also have a report uh, coming back with how the plowing works because that's another headache that may be looking good on paper, but in reality, it's not a good idea. But I'll come back with that. And plowing. Okay. Councilor Burke. Okay. So um, just, just as to, to the plowing point, we, we, we can carve out an emergency exception as well, just like we did for, um, you know, the legal, yeah, you, you know, the, the, the lawyers, the, the you know, emergency case or something like that so you, you can carve that out too Dave in yeah, there. But you can but the problem with that is that you're talking I'm talking to Mike you gotta you gotta sit up and talk to the mic the problem with it is if you do a plowing and you set your rates the state's gonna eat up all these plowers well we pay them and what the state pays them it's difficult to get them because they'd rather be plowing out there but I understand what you're saying and that's why I'd rather come back with a report versus talking out of my right. we'll, we'll talk right. it out so right so and I'm just gonna make another one one point that th there are numerous municipalities <laughs> that have public procurement already in place for, for these situations including plowing and towing I, I, I mean they're mm -hmm. Right. Hundreds. And Maybe the, we soon sell as well. And the goal is that so, our mean, next so we're, meeting. We're not, we're not inventing this out of whole cloth. I just want to make right. that clear. Right. right. So at our next meeting, we'll have an opportunity to look at those exemptions and see which ones we want to keep and which ones we may wish to exclude. So on That's that. why we get the big bucks to make those decisions. Uh, I make a motion and be tabled. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dave. Appreciate it. And Kara, we'll put thank the word you. out you're not retiring yet. <laughs> Ten more years to go. <laughs> I'll accept a motion to take up items 11 and 12 as a package, please. Second. On favor? Aye. So item 11 was filed by Councillor Sullivan, order that the discard of refuse items on public or private property in excess of two pounds constitutes an act of illegal dumping. Examples are items such as mattresses, furniture, tires, bags of household trash, etc. Penalty for such illegal disposal to be no less than $1,000 and up to $2,500. Reward for arrest and conviction, $250. Item 12, filed by Councillor Sullivan. The discard of hazardous or regulated waste be subject to fines of $2,500 to $5,000. Reward leading to arrest and conviction of $500. Examples would be asbestos, PCBs, lead, mercury, etc. This would include items containing hazardous materials such as refrigerators, freon, brake pads, 
floor tile, asbestos, paint, and batteries, lead, light fixtures, PCBs. So, um, Councillor Sullivan, would you like to review your intention with this? And um, will we need to suspend the rules again for Councillor, uh, for Attorney Cunha? No, we're under suspension. Unless you okay, unless we'll continue under suspension if you if we have questions for legal. Well, I, I Councilor think. Councillor Sullivan. I, I think we'd like to continue our suspension. Also, we have a few guests here that were invited. Also, Thank we invited in our superintendent yeah. and our chief. And Welcome. Thank you, I'll, folks, for coming down. I'll also, board of board of health. Oh, Ernie. Yeah. Ernie, 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 welcome. Oh. Let's get everybody a microphone. Testing, testing. I, I, think, I think we're good. Sure? Okay. Yeah. Right. Unless you want to just hop them down one. Fire away, Mike. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for being here so late tonight and patiently waiting around for this. Um, uh, the reason uh, we, we've been trying to address uh, a lot of the blight issues around the city, uh, especially with the buildings, the vacant buildings, uh, you know, the appearance uh, when people come into town, uh, I think everyone's aware uh, how bad this is. I think in Hoyoke, um, it's it's worse than any of the surrounding communities. I put out a, um, a packet. I only had time to make three copies. I, I think Linda's got one. I passed it around and. Uh, um, the uh, the invited guests here have all had a chance to peruse it. These are some photos we took around town of uh, various examples uh, from various areas of the city. And as you can see, everything, you, you can find it from just driving around. Anybody that's familiar with Holyoke, you'll, you'll see somehow in the middle of the night, the, uh, the Easter Bunny hops through here and drops off stuff that's there the next morning that was not there the day before and it's big stuff I, I find it uh, interesting uh, you know nobody uh, the, the reason for the large fine is nobody nobody seems to notice this going on nobody ever seems to see it uh, I know stuff like this has been tried in the past uh, years you know qu quite a few years ago with the uh, everybody having a cell phone with a camera on it now and a large reward like this, I would think it would make it very easy for someone to snap a picture. Um, we've dealt with some of it in the past. As I understand the procedure now, we have to call the Board of Health. They have to come and look at it first, and um, uh, then it falls somewhat on the uh, police department at that point to go after the people, the DPW to pick the stuff up. Um, uh, you know, to get some kind of a unified attack going on this problem. Uh, the interesting thing in, in what we've been able to discover so far in this of the four or five examples where we've been able to follow up on it, the uh, perpetrators here were not from Holyoke. They're not local people. These uh, uh, were coming from uh, Granby, Belchertown, and you've got one example in there as far as away as Wethersfield, Connecticut. So it's it's not so much a, a problem as some of the other stuff we've been trying to address with bulk items for uh, um, tenants and uh, uh, apartment uh, uh, tenants. Um, th this is people doing garage cleanouts, uh, stuff like that. They're making a living off of it, and you know, charging other people for the service and just dumping the stuff. It's not all of it, but it's a good chunk of it. Uh, the reason for the, besides reward, the high fines is right now, if you bring in a couch or a, a refrigerator to DPW and you've got a card, you can you can you get one or two for free each year, and then there's a twenty-five dollar uh, fee to be paid. If somebody can drive through here, somebody that's doing garage cleanouts and doing stuff like this and they're over their limit, well, they just throw it out on the side of the road, DPW picks it up for free, and they're off. 
Now the, 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 the mechanism is already in place. If they bring it, they're over their limit, they pay 25 bucks. So right now, if you don't, the, the, the fines in place right now are like $30. So if a guy gets away with it twice, he's ahead of the game. <laughs> All right, so let's really raise the ante and let's take it out on the people, especially that are coming from out of town to dump here in Hoyoke. I'm sorry, Councilor Sullivan. I don't have um, the photos immediately available. If you have them, I'll pass them around to the committee. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, since we're, we're and, and since we're addressing them both at the same time, mm -hmm. when when you jump into the other ones, a lot of people don't realize uh, a lot of the other things out there. When we're talking about the asbestos, this isn't people throwing bags of asbestos out. Uh, it's not proper. There, there's brake pads from cars contain asbestos from trucks. Uh, clock on windows, uh, window caulking, uh, certain types of drywall plaster, certain types of roofing cement and shingles, all, all contain asbestos. Um, floor tiles contain asbestos. Um, it, uh, the ballast and old fluorescent light fixtures contain PCBs. So uh, that's why these are separated out into a, a much higher fine also. And you're finding this stuff everywhere, down along the river, uh, on the side streets, in the alleys, and we've got to put a stop to it, a boat. Okay? I thought you'd get a kick out of that one. It's incredible. Yep. So if we have folks here who could maybe give us some input as to this order and under suspension of rules, um, Attorney Cunha, if there are any issues around the fines and the like, so who would like to address this uh, good evening counselors I'll Thanks, jump Chief. in <laughs> certainly um, uh, I think the uh, order has merit I, I just I caution on the size of the fine because I I, uh, I I understand that you know uh, somebody from Wethersfield Connecticut they're cleaning out the garage and dumping in Holyoke that's that's crazy right uh, but I do worry about good bad or indifferent uh, uh, some citizen from Holyoke getting caught up with a, you know, a two thousand dollar fine that they can't possibly afford. Uh, the only other thing I would say on, on the fine structure is, and I would defer to the law department. What happens if we fine and they don't pay? Um, another avenue to po possibly pursue is, is um, I know this has had some discussions in the past, is some type of camera system. You know, if you have a, what I call a, a fairly freaking area of the city that things just seem to show up at, that would probably be an ideal location for a camera system. Now, I went looking the other day, again, this is not through Dave uh, Martins or purchasing, just, you know, Googling. Um, they have some pretty uh, uh, good cameras out there, but there's a significant expense in that, almost to where it's like, geez, we can't afford that, or I got to get grant money to go buy it. Because they're not given. It's not a simple camera. It's a little, bit, you know, it's motion detected and, and it puts a warning in and everything else. Also, that uh, we may want to have a conversation with the Mass DEP because they've had issues like this with other parts of the state, where they've been a good partner. Where they've come in. I don't know if they've what they've done on the price of the cameras that they've utilized or that the local police departments had to buy, but they have been a good partner and had some success to address some of these issues in other areas of, of the Commonwealth with cameras and, and mass DEP, DEP came in as a partner. The other thing I would uh, defer to the DEP on on some of this is, you know, I'm, no, I am, I'm no expert in truck traffic. You know, you know they're gonna have a log book and everything else. So the, the enforcement on truck traffic's a little different than a regular traffic ticket. The same thing would be going through here with uh, hazardous waste. I do think uh, DEP at some point has the ability, if someone's dumping hazardous waste, to levy some substantial fines, more so than whatever we put in the ordinance. What that would be, I'm just I'm speaking off the cuff on that. So I, I understand all that point. Just so I understand, the, the problem we've been having isn't with uh, abatement companies as such doing you know, disposal of hazardous waste. That's right in the, the DEP's got a very good handle on that. It's uh, your common uh, uh, handyman, fix it up guy, 
home repair guy just taking the stuff out of the house and in, in bags and discarding it on the side of the road. And that's where the stuff, floor tiles, it's, it's turning up. Uh, um, as far as the size of the fine and somebody not being able to pay it, I'd, I'd come straight back. If you don't want to pay the fine, don't do the crime. Uh, it, there's, some, there's some leeway in there, 1000 to $2,500. Um, uh, I, I just felt it had to be at a much higher, the, you know, the judges, is, I think you well know, quite often can be quite lenient, as lenient as it's allowed. And that's why I'd like to peg it that high, so that's as lenient as they can get. Councilor name? Yeah. Um, I think, and I, Kara, maybe you can touch on it, but I, I think we we're capped at three hundred dollars uh, for a fine, correct? On a per day, or is it? Can we create something that says multiple days, is multiple violations, perhaps? But I know, I think, in and of itself, we can only give a civil violation up to three hundred. Um, I think that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you want to touch on some of the fine structure, the other thing, if you could touch on, is and and Councillor Sullivan raises a really good question, and it's always something I've always wondered about, but I just never got around to asking until he presented it. This notion of the can cities establish rewards for information leading to the arrest and conviction of people for doing various heinous things? For example, say we wanted to. Hoyo creates a policy, X citizen gives us information that leads to the arrest and conviction of someone for murder, okay? Someone gives us information that leads to the arrest and conviction of somebody who does illegal dumping. So, you know, obviously in categories of their own heinousness, but I have seen this around the country, I'm sure you have too, that these type of rewards, you know, arrest and conviction of someone harming a police officer or a firefighter or something like this. Do we have the authority if we wanted to create one of these type of reserves accounts to post these type of reward programs? Um, he raises this issue in here. Something we haven't really talked about, which is kind of a novel concept. Uh, I would, I'd just be interested to know the authority on that. Sure. So uh, a few points. So by statute, a fine for an ordinance, the maximum is $300. Um, each day can be considered a separate violation, so it could be $300 a day. Um, there is a state law, it's uh, Chapter 270, Section 16, which is the uh, illegal dumping statute, which does set higher fines. Um, it's not more than $5,500 for the first offense. 5500 Yep, and not to exceed 15000 for each subsequent offense. However, 50% of the fine goes to a conservation trust um, for the state, but there will be more on that point. Um, mm. And this section can be, it, it can be enforced by the city police officers. Um, That's good to know. So, well, and I will answer your question about the rewards as well. So to that point, though, several communities have done special acts where by they've been allowed to keep all of the fines. Um, and it actually was the cities of Worcester, Lynn, Brockton, and Fitchburg, and they're all very similar, um, where they create a program against illegal dumping. And um, at least in Worcester, it was initially created as a pilot program, to de and they worded as determine the effectiveness of establishing its own fines and other penalties uh, for legal dumping and to collect those fines and penalties. And so I would have to imagine it was done as a special act to allow for the increased fines to you know, get around the limit of $300, as well as likely to be able <coughs> to keep the entire amount of these higher fines. Because if you're just um, proceeding under the state law as it is right now, half of it would have to go to the conservation trust fund. Uh, and then just to the point of the reward, we actually already have that as an ordinance. It was we done do. um, when Councilor, I worked with uh, Councilor Vega when he was a city councilor, and we rewrote um, most of Chapter 74, and that was one of the provisions that was included, and I okay. have it here somewhere. It's Chapter 74-102 of our ordinance that um, if it's information that leads to a conviction of the state statute, 
270.16, there can be a reward established. Which is the murder statute, correct? It's the state, it's the illegal dumping. Oh, statute. illegal dumping, okay. Yeah, no, this is specifically in regards oh, okay, to illegal, illegal dumping. dumping. Um, I do, I have the exact wording of it somewhere. Does it establish an amount? That's what. Uh, maybe I didn't print that section. I can look though. Okay. But it it, it is it's specifically. Oh wait, it's right here. Um, it is the city may offer a reward for reporting a violation of Chapter Two Seventy Section Sixteen which results in either criminal prosecution or non-criminal disposition. The amount of the reward may be up to 50% of the amount of fines levied, no more than $1,000. In the event that no fines are levied, a $100 reward may be offered. And I don't remember, because that was 2011, but we probably base that on other communities. I would have to go back and look, but we do have that on the books. Okay. So the, to is that something that we adopted that because the state law allows us to do that or and my next question is could we do those type of rewards for other types of things theoretically um, so but obviously yeah. there's some statutory authority for to allow I, us yeah to do i that. don't i don't remember specifically looking into that i'd have to go yeah. back and see yeah, where we'll give it, that we'll give it some we'll give it some thought but uh i don't think we've ever actually <laughs> used it so so um, thank you, Kara. That was that was my questions there. Um, I did want to ask whoever might be able to, probably the police chief uh, on these. How many tickets, just ballpark, um, would you say last year we issued for these type of illegal dumping violations last year? I mean, um, I mean how many people are we per se catching for these type of things? I had the logs run. We had 12 calls for uh, illegal dumping last year. And I think there was only one of them was referred to code enforcement for follow-up. What that follow-up is, I can't tell you. The other call was um, the license plate didn't come back on the vehicle that was registered to. And the other, the other 10 of them didn't pan out other than illegal dump person was gone. So we're not sure if any tickets were issued Correct. last year. Okay. Correct. Likely, perhaps not, because Correct. you would know if the ticket. Because even though, just so I understand the process, you would send that up to code enforcement, but then code enforcement would, would advise you to actually write the ticket on one of your officers, right? Right. They would have written it out, and they should have written a report on it. Okay. But only only you guys can do the tickets. The code enforcement can't do the tickets. They would do an investigation, right? No. You can do tickets as well. Okay. The, um, Ernie, have you guys issued? Have you guys uh, did code enforcement issue any tickets last year? I, I would say we we probably issue between 20 and 30 a year. 20 and 30 a year, okay. Oh, that's good to know. Yeah, we get about 40, probably 40 to 50, to 50 illegal dumping complaints, but... About half know, of those materials, We're lucky if yeah. we can narrow, you know, 70% of those down to an individual uh, who, you know, who was the violator. Uh, you know, we often can't find... Right. You know who you know who dumped the material because there's no there's no paperwork in the materials dump with a name or an address, and if that's the case, <coughs> um, and and there's no eye, uh, eyewitness of of a person who's seen who dumped that material there, you know unfortunately we we have to cite the owner and and, and the owner holds the responsibility, you know yeah. for cleaning up the uh, you know the illegal dumping. Yeah, w material. which is kind of leading. Sure, which is kind of uh, leading into my next question is, of the tickets that you're issuing, you say 20, 30 tickets, how many are against the offender, the known offender, you know, we gotcha, I would say versus so, the... I would say 75% of those. Okay. And oh, the, good. All right. And then 25% the is against the owner who happens to be the unfortunate recipient of all this trash or tires and debris or right, whatever. But the owner doesn't initially receive a ticket. The owner, he, the owner, he or she initially receives a um, an enforcement order to clean it up. Which and costs with, more than a ticket. Maybe we should just give the owners tickets and let the stuff stay there. With the threat of being fined if they don't if they don't comply within the deadline. 
Then if they don't comply, then then we issue a ticket. Okay. All right. Yeah. Council McGivern. But most property owners do comply. Um, we do have a high compliance rate with you know with property owners and cleaning up properties that um, that have you know people have illegally dumped on their property. On their property, yes. Council McGivern. I hope that we are not raising fines on owners of properties no who have been dumped on no because kidding. I'll get a pickup truck and I'll believe I'll bring it to the home of the person who gave that ticket out and then they can get a ticket for being illegally dumped on unless they catch me um, it's ridiculous what is going on in this city with people who who happen to be living on an alleyway people who have maybe a vacant lot or a large residential home and they're dumped on and we tell them they have to clean it up it's ridiculous. I have friends who have cameras, Chief. They'll be glad to show you the people that are walking up and down the alleyway and doing this. They'll be glad to let you know, Billy, that this is not their problem when there's tires in the middle of an alleyway. It's not the owner of the properties. You know, it's, it's the person who's doing it. Mike, Mike Sullivan brought in and shows you, shows you. It's not even Hoyle people who are doing this. And if an owner of a property is treated like that, shame on this city. Start working with these people, for God's sakes. It's wrong. It's just dead wrong. I won't vote for any fine that goes to the owner of a property because <laughs> someone else dumped on their property. Thank you. Um, I would note, too, that it's an urban problem and it's also a rural problem because there's a lot of people out in West Holyoke that own a lot of acreage and people love to go up there on Appermont Highway. They're dumping in the woods. Senior citizens, 80 years old, are getting notices they have to clean up the property. I mean, it's not the fault of the city. You notice who you have to notice, you know what I mean? I, I, but um, to Councilor McGivern's point, I've had people complaining to me, you know, and what can we do? We post notices, no dumping, um, mm -hmm. you know, but I think we would have to craft this in some way to protect the property owners that actually are the victims of this. Yeah, uh, I just want to point out that Councilman McGinn and I couldn't agree with you more. We we work very hard with property owners to clean their to get their properties cleaned up, uh, and 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 sometimes if they're elderly and uh, you know we'll have you know DPW um, help them out and and and. Uh, Bill Fugway and his, and his uh, crew are great at doing that also. In, in addition, uh, if the Board of Health is ignored by an enforcement letter, and we don't issue a ticket without making phone calls and trying to reach the person, and a ticket's not issued until, uh, uh, until there's no response, they're not returning calls, they're totally ignoring you know our attempts to make contact with them in, in the enforcement letter then 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 we issue the ticket and if the property is cleaned up we drop the monetary value even though they've ignored us for a while we you know we won't you know we'll you know we'll drop the monetary value and, and uh, <clears throat> so there'll be no there'll be no payment if the property is cleaned so in most cases even though they get a ticket they're not fine because through all the attempts to, and the help with DPW, we do we do manage to get all the properties clean, and then drop and then and then drop the monetary value on the tickets, fines after it's clean. Fifty years ago, last year, Officer Obi solved the biggest crime in Massachusetts for illegal dumping, and those perpetrators were taken care of. If you don't believe me, just listen to Alice's Restaurant. We need to resolve this through good work. Working with them is good, Ernie. I, I understand that, and I always um, uh, re appreciate the, the Department of Health working with yeah. them. But sooner or later, it, this isn't like it just you know a couple couple times. It, it, Ward four, Ward one, and two. How many how many times a year do they organize alleyway <laughs> cleanups? The trash shouldn't come from the people who live there. You know, it comes from a number of sources. Dumpsters who are who are left open in, in the apartment buildings. Illegal dumping is a lot bigger than that, though. The wind tunnels, we understand. Illegal dumping is a lot bigger than that. Why don't we go after them? Not talk about it. Let's go after them. Stop it. A big fine woodwork. 
if we did enforcement. Joe, uh, so, um, the Board of Health has has a lot of dialogue with property owners in in terms of uh, of catching these illegal dump dumpers, and uh, you know we you know we instruct them to um, to install cameras if 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 they want to. Uh, go that route and, and, and some of them do um, you know we also encourage them to if their staff uh, observes anyone dumping to uh, take a picture with their uh, with, you know with their cell phone that they can email it to us text it to us we could use that to issue a warning uh, I'm, I'm not a warning but to issue a monetary we, we, we usually start with a hundred dollars fine um, Chiefs, not, Chiefs uh, can, can, can attest that. I've sent him many requests to uh, provide me with people's identification from license plate numbers, and we use that information in addition with the photos provided by the landlords to go after the perpetrators, the violators, and we did get them, and we did find them. So we, so, so we are getting, Illegal dumping so we are nature. getting the word out there uh, to the violators that if you get caught, you're gonna get caught. <coughs> And, and that's fine, Ernie. But it comes to a point where this needs to be treated criminally. It comes to a point where we have to look at this as a crime when a person from out of town, from out of state, drives down an alleyway and dumps four tires, dumps something that has, a, has asbestos in it, dumps something that is clearly not from the city of Hoyle. Yeah, Joe, that's got to be a crime, not, not a civil fine, <coughs> not a shame on you. And we do treat those cases like a crime. We, we don't even issue an enforcement letter. They get a. When's they the last a, arrest? They get a ticket fine right away, and uh, um, and if they don't pay it, we, we you know we go to court on it. Thank you. Thank you, Council Bartley. Yeah, Ernie, why don't you just briefly tell uh, tell the public about what we were working on last year over in uh, Kmart land. We had uh, we have several cases that uh, that the Board of Health work with, um, uh, uh, and I, and, I, and I believe there were probably three of them that we that we rectified within a two month within a, probably a month or a two month period. Uh, we, we found out who the violators were. We got them to clean it up. Um, you know we you know, we issued them tickets. They 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 complied, uh, and if they comply within a Swift period of time, you know, usually we'll reduce the fine or drop the fine. Um, plus all, all the proactive work you did all, and right, with all and the vendors in Kmart as well. Ernie. Right, and I, and I believe I've traded emails with property owners that that were CC'd to some some counselors, and I personally instructed them how to provide us with information with the, uh, you know, with the, uh, uh, you know, with the problems they have with illegal dumping in their alleyways and. Uh, I believe Councilor Lisi was probably one of them. Saw my emails and instructing them what type of inf what type of information to provide us with, uh, and you know we do catch a lot of them. Um, uh, it, it, it's a it's a challenge, but we catch them. Um, I would just like to ask a quick question of Kara. If you can think of a way that we might craft this where it would target the ones we want to reach without punishing. <laughs> the homeowners that end up with the dumping on their actual property. That would be helpful. Councilor Jordan, and then I have Councilor Sullivan in the queue. Yeah, obviously we're gonna have to craft some language here. Um, but I was also interested to know, like what's the average ticket or sort of fine now these days? You, you These 20 or 30 people, Ernie, that- It's, you, prog it's progressive, we use the the first violation is $100, the second violation is 200 the third violation is 300 Okay. Um, and that's the way it's stated in the ordinance, okay. and also in the Mass General Laws also. Um, okay, so the, the average violator, um, I'm interested to know, so the guy you catch throwing, you know, dumping the tires in the alleyway, the proverbial, you know, or like I saw, you know, opposite Providence Hospital, you know, if you come around the sort of milk jug that you're coming north on uh, Route 5 and you take that turn swinging around to go into the hospital, I pull in w one day to go to work and I, on the side of the road is somebody just dumped a mattress and a box spring sitting right there on the side of the road. I'm just thinking to myself, you've got to be kidding me, you know. And it's this type of just 
idiocy that uh, that that goes on that just drives you know citizens crazy. Um, so violator X, you catch them, you give them a ticket for what a hundred bucks, and then and then what? They have to go over there. Well, they have to go clean it up and. They have to go clean it up. We usually, we usually uh, have them notify us when they're going to be at the site cleaning it. Um, we like to go there and meet them, talk to them, um, and we do that sometimes, and sometimes we don't. Yeah. It depends upon what our, uh, you know, what our workload is and what our time span is. Um, I get. I, I'm just. Then, yeah. Then again, the biggest problem is is that these people are dumping. Um, and they're dumping a tire because it costs ten dollars to take it somewhere, and they don't have that ten dollars. Yeah, so, well, so, not so, our problem. You know, sort of dumping them on the side of the road, and yeah. you're giving them a hundred dollar fine when they can't get rid of a ten dollar tire. So it's hard to collect mm -hmm. that fine. Yeah, um, which comes back to you know maybe maybe it is maybe at some point it becomes an issue of a, of a criminal matter. You know, yeah, um, I, I find it hard to somehow they came up with the money to purchase the tire at some magical time predating that right so they had the money to buy the tire they just don't want to spend the money and of course you know it gets down to people's financial priorities yeah, well, you know they, they don't want to spend I mean conceivably they have a vehicle that has four tires on it so they don't want to spend they, they have to a vehicle at all time generally needs four tires so we usually collect the fine um when when we when we when we file the ticket in court for a hearing, then they pay, yeah. then they pay the fine before the hearing because they don't want to go to court. And it's a hundred bucks. It's hundred bucks. So let's let's just think about this through now. Your time is valuable. Um, police department's time is valuable. Bill's time is valuable. Everybody's time is valuable. You chase down these twenty thirty scoff laws. And it's time consuming. Time consuming. We're going through all this rigmarole. And you're going to court potentially, and we're going to go down there and put the hammer down, and we're handing people hundred dollar fines. And I guess it does speak to the point Councilor Sullivan is saying is you got the culprit. You know, again, I I totally agree with um, Councilor McGivern that we don't want to re-victimize the victims, the property owners. You know, I, I'd say definitely work with them to clean it up and give them time. Um, or the city helps them out, or we do something to work with people, um, and we're certainly not going fine heavy on them. But for that that nice little class of people that choose to do this, they really do need to be made examples of, and um, so that the word gets out there that you know Hoyoke's not this dump you can just go throw your stuff around into, and that it's going to be a hell of a lot more than 100 bucks because we got to go through this whole rigmarole. One, to identify you, to catch you, to monitor that you cleaned it up, to go through this. we got to go to court. We're going to chase you down and all this stuff. And we're losing money, all this time and effort, for some degenerate person who chooses to illegally dump because they're too lazy to bring it to some place that costs infinitesimally less money to bring it into, we're now, the good citizens, have to pay our tax money to pay for all of this infrastructure to catch these people to do illegal things. So my point is either the fines have to be a hell of a lot more and they come down and pay 20 bucks a month, okay, I don't know what it is, you know, the, with the court, if they get some judgment against them, they'll pay twenty dollars a month until now, till the day they die, if that's what it means. Um, or, back to Joe's point, maybe there is a criminal tune-up here where these people need to be put on probation and monitored in by probation or something. I mean, you can't expect these people to be put into jail for illegal dumping unless it's, you know, something really noxious. But um, I just, I just don't see the courts, you know, putting people like this in jail. But. I think we do have to take a tougher approach because you, you're thinking if we catch 30 people and we charge $3,000 in fines, what did it cost us to go after these 30 people? It's not a much, it's obviously not enough of a deterrent. Councillor Sullivan, yeah, uh, maker of the order. Thanks. Well, one thing, um, I didn't, I don't want uh, Ernie or any of the rest of you to think that 
you're being dragged in here because anybody's unhappy with the job that you guys are doing. I'm no. trying to get I'm trying to get input back from you also and craft something that has, uh, to what Kevin was just saying, some real teeth in it, um, so that so that we can start to really solve this problem. Um, the 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 question I have, uh, Bill, can you tell these guys, uh, you know, just off to know hard numbers, gut sense, how, how how many times a week, how many times a month, how much stuff do your guys just plain have to pick up because it's there, you know? It, we, uh, we go out quite frequently and, and we utilize the, uh, the services of the Sheriff's Department, which is our in-house labor for, for a lot of cleanup work. Uh, we don't we don't quantify or document it, but you know we would uh, we would probably go out at least uh, once a week on a on a special detail to go out and and pick up some some tires or debris or whatever that's been left somewhere along the roadside or in a in a vacant lot. And the stuff the sheriff's part and collects is coming in through your facility, and there's no it, it's landing out in the dumpsters with the rest of the sofas and refrigerators and tires and everything else. And yeah, the city's pay, through, and the city's paying for that. Correct. We run it through our, our process, and, and it, uh, it's included in all of our operating costs, yeah. Would you say that's thousands of dollars a month? Uh, no, it's hard, to, it's hard to quantify. We don't, we don't count, and I, I couldn't say, you know, put a dollar value on it, but it's, it's uh, you know, it would have cost a lot more if we were using our labor. Uh, in this case, the, the Sheriff's Department labor is, is a lot less than, than having our people do it, but... Uh, you know that's a that's a benefit we have to, to help keep uh, keep the impact down to the city. But uh, frankly, we don't we don't track it and and, and keep that detail or record to to put a dollar value on it. Well, the, the thing I'd like to suggest to the rest of the community, everybody else, if if it's if it's just one item a day that's not being paid twenty five dollars to dump there, we're talking a thousand dollars right there. Um, as as far as um, enforcement um, catching them I, I think um, chief from the police department I, I think most uh, I think a lot of this is happening after dark right and um, if it became part of the daily uh, routine on the, the shifts if they can pick up an out-of-date registration sticker or sticker on the back of our plate uh, if, they, if the guys out there were a little tuned in when we see pickup trucks riding around at night with mattresses they're not coming from bedding barn to move into their apartment with them or from uh, uh, Manny's uh, to bring the new refrigerator home and stuff like that and the guys just kind of look look out for this kind of stuff um, as far as uh, the last thing I'd like to say on my part here uh, I don't know what other wording care I understand the problem with collecting the fines and having to go to court and all this stuff eating up everybody's valuable time. Uh, I've seen other instances where they don't bother with it. Just um, that when they go, there, there's other ways I've seen with fines that aren't paid where the person can't renew the, their driver's license. They can't renew the registration on their vehicle or a lien can get attached to their property and just sit back and let nature take its course. Can we do that? <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, what's the penalty to the the, the the scoff law doesn't own the property, right? So what's what the enforcement mechanism is just keep hauling them in the court, hauling them in the court. You could ask for a capius, I suppose, if they don't show up. KPS, um, and then there's costs associated yeah. with that with serving it. I mean, um, I mean, like I said, under the state law, the police do have the authority to enforce that, and so that could then be criminal prosecutions that would be done in conjunction with the police and the district attorney. Um, and I think those would probably be criminal fines as well, so that would obviously be a stronger process. I mean, we don't usually pursue criminal violations of city ordinance. So, is are, that the two seventy sixteen? Right. Are there criminal statutes on these issues? 
already? Um, State? Uh, I don't. I, I could be wrong. I don't believe we can criminally arrest for under state statute for illegal dumping. I think the way it in there would be whether you go by the capius or we explore the option of making a custody arrest for a city ordinance violation because I believe we can do that. Um, it's it's a petition for issuance of a complaint with the clerk of the district court. So I don't know if that's... Uh, yeah, that's a criminal complaint in the court. That's not necessarily an arrest. Well, no, oh, if yeah. it's in lay yeah. of an arrest, right? right? So you have to go petition if there's probable cause. But yeah, but my, my point is, if there is a criminal statute, you could take the information that Ernie's department has gathered on offender X, and instead of seeking the $100 fine, especially if this is, you know, second time you've seen violator X, um, or it's something particularly egregious, perhaps you do the application for criminal complaint under the state statute, and seek, and seek to if you can get a criminal complaint issued. You know, assuming you have enough there for probable cause. That might be to really start. You know, making examples of some of these individuals that, you know, the guy like for example, there's a picture here. Somebody drops off a boat. I mean, I mean, there's just something like totally over the top. Mm -hmm. You know, or somebody drops really noxious <clears throat> waste that. Some children could be walking by there or be exposed to something. I mean, these people are creating serious public hazards. Right. The Board of Health writes tickets under a non-criminal disposition ordinance. Um, and, <coughs> and that ordinance gives us the authority to write tickets. Without that ordinance being in place, which was passed probably in the 80s, we wouldn't have the authority to write tickets. No, but I'm saying in lieu of Ernie, of, I'm saying take your investigation Right. and work in concert with the police it, where if it's a lower level thing right you do the ticket the normal process right. maybe maybe we in this process jack up the ticket price okay but for something that's perhaps more egregious I think there needs to be a serious conversation about you know an application for the criminal complaint if the state law allows us to do that so Kara given the discussion that we've had and, and the sense that you're getting from it is this a matter of enforcement and proper utilization of current law, or do we need to change language to affect what Councillor Sullivan is trying to achieve here? I mean, it seems like, I mean, our, the section, I think it's enforced under now, it is called depositing of litter, but it's throwing any litter onto other property. Um, I'm, from what I've heard, is you know, one option would be to raise that fine, but it can only be a maximum of three hundred dollars and so then beyond that it's either acting under the state law where potentially half the fines are going to go to the conservation trust or pursuing a special act that would allow us to then keep those fines and those special acts do set higher fines yep. um, again because it's it's going around that. so so we could craft that under this under these orders, if that was the direction the committee would like to go in? Uh, I think so, yeah. Okay. So. Councilor Sullivan? It, it has to go to the State Conservation Fund. It couldn't go to the Hoyle Conservation Fund. No, it's or the con State. We should do the Special oh, Act and keep everything. Right, That's right, 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 the Special right. Act. Mm -hmm. And then we can use those dollars to do more cleanups and deterrence, you know, help the victims. So what, um, to the maker of the order, what would be your preference? Would you like to see the committee take action to pursue the special act relative to um, accessing the state path? Yes, I, I think we've got to have more teeth in it than three hundred dollars. Yeah. So I'll I'll move that we request the law department to draft up a draft special act language that imposes. Um, do we want to state the numbers here now? Um, what are, I mean, is there a suggested amount? 500, 1,000? Well, uh, well, uh, or do we want to just, maybe we, to be determined on that? And I can give you back for the next time you take this up, the drafts from the other communities. Which yeah, that might be helpful. All look fairly similar, but I didn't review them all word Maybe for we word. can review what they use for penalties. And then separately, the $300 would come under our own ordinances. Right. We could amend Which that could as be well. Done. Right. We could do that. 
Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So Progress. this will so this will go to Progress. legal for legal form to come back to committee. So yep. we've but do so do we need to table this for the legal form to come back to committee? So. Yeah. So I make so a motion need, eleven and twelve be tabled, pending the uh, language from the other. Okay. Progress. Okay. If, if you Thank gentlemen you have much. if if you gentlemen have any further thoughts before we finalize this and want to add anything to what you've heard or any suggestions or enhancements or Kara, if I could get copies of those uh, orders from the other cities that you have uh, I'd like to take a look at it on myself to see where the the PD angle is on it and so that uh, Ernie and I can look at uh, doing something a little different okay can I have a motion on item 13 motion to take up 13 second on fair all right, all right. Item 13, filed by Councilor Jordan. Order that. Thank you very much Thanks, for coming guys. down Appreciate and it. being patient. You too. Take too. care. Careful in the snow. Order that whenever the mayor sells a property to anyone, that he first notify all the butters prior to agreeing to that sale. That an ordinance be created to this effect. Motion oh. approved by legal form. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> we Aye. already did that. Oh, oh is draft? that what we're doing? We're oh. reviewing the draft. Okay, let's draft? review the draft. Do we have the language? Oh, it's in there already? Oh. Oh, no problem. I think you had uh, mentioned that earlier. Should we wait to adopt it all as one package? Okay. As opposed to adopt it under the current law? Why, why do we have to wait? Uh, my only concern about waiting is what if we're... I mean, you think we're going to bang out the other thing fairly quickly? Because I just don't want to go straggling along with the. Uh... Right. Yeah. Yeah. Then you'll just. Right. Okay. So, um, do we so have do the want... final? Do you have the final language? It's in... it's in the draft she gave us tonight. Oh, I didn't get that. This right here. Yeah. Right here. It's under the property oh, okay. disposition, which is. Um... The whole thing is there, so it's. Just what, which what? page is it? Page three, four. Page four. Oh, notification to a butter. Yeah, Roman numeral four. So if there's anything you, I, I think it's what you talked about the last time yep. you took it up. But if there's any changes. All right, let's just read through this. The record owners of the properties that directly abut or is directly across a public way or alley from a parcel that has been declared surplus shall be notified of its availability by one being sent a copy of the advertisement placed in the central register in connection with an invitation for bids or request for proposals or two being sent a copy of the order declaring the parcel surplus at least 14 days prior to any offer being submitted by the mayor to the city council seems reasonable okay so I make a motion. So then the motion stands because we already we adopted we it. already adopted it. Okay, so can I just read it one more time, Kevin? To myself. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so that's we can add it in, and then that section might be renumbered. But it's that's fine if you do the other. That's fine. Okay. We'll get that on the books right away, and then when we that'll be in the new one. Good. Yep. Okay. Uh, motion to take up item 14, please. Motion to remove that from the table. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Can we pass out those? Thank you. This is um, filed by Councilor Bartley to amend the Holyoke Court of Code of Ordinances relative to pawnbrokers. We had um, moved on this and sent it to legal for language, which we have before us tonight. Almost lost you there. Okay, so the order reads 
that um, city businesses be required, subject to these laws, be required to photograph any merchandise it receives, buys and sells, and to photograph any sellers, and then upload the photos onto a police computer system for the purpose of making an electronic record. Currently, pawnbrokers are only required to keep a book open to the inspection of the mayor and city council or any other duly authorized person. Further, the amendment should require said dealers to hold items for at least 30 days prior to resale, and the amendment should require pawnbrokers and secondhand dealers to register with the chief of police. So I'll defer to the maker of the order, Councillor Bartley, or uh, maybe uh, Attorney Cunha could just run through the key points of this. Would that be helpful? Sure. Okay. Adding the, the language um, from the order, so... On the first page, it's for pawnbrokers. Um, that, in addition to the book, they're requi already required to keep every pawnbroker shall photograph any merchant merchandise it receives, buys, and sells, and photograph any sellers of such items. Photographs shall be uploaded onto a police computer system. Um, and then adding into the pawnbroker section, which isn't currently there, that any merchandise shall be held for a period of 30 days prior to being resold and that the dates shall be recorded. Um, and then under the sections of the license for pawnbrokers comes from the city council, so adding a requirement that a copy of any license granted by the council is provided to the police to maintain a log. Oh, yeah, thank you for that, Kara. So I, I would just read through this. The only, the only, I, I think it reads fine, just other than 22164, where it says... Um, I just want to strike one, two, th four, w four words in there. So it says, um, the second sentence, records of the dates, records of the dates merchandise is received and resold shall be kept in the book required pursuant to section 22-162. I just want to delete the words in the book required. Okay. If I'm, so can I make that, I'd like to make that amendment to strike those four words. So moved. And, and so, Do I have a second? Second. Where is it though? I'm sorry. In 22164, the new proposed. Yeah, second page. Page two. Second page. Top. Second sentence. It says, in the book required. I, I, the sentence would, be, would read, records of the dates merchandise is received and resold shall be kept pursuant to section 22162, which goes into, yeah. you know, the more electronic recording as opposed to a, you know, a written book that right. no one's ever seen. Sure. So. so we have a motion and a second to amend. All in favor? Aye. Um, so then there's still two more pages of changes that were in regards to the junk and secondhand dealers, yep. Yep. Um, which is basically the same requirements for photographing. Um, under 66-33, mm -hmm. sure. there was a requirement that every day the dealer gives a report to the police and so I think if it's being done electronically that part can probably be deleted as it would be automatic anyways um, the second hand dealers already have a requirement that it merchandise not be sold for 30 days and so then the last change is just adding in similarly that a copy of a license granted by the council is given to the police department okay Kara nice work thank you for uh, staying on point um, I'm pretty much good to go with this but I don't know if other people have questions, so. I had a question. Yeah, so Lisi. Um, I had a question about. Um, I didn't feel that we were um, all on the same page about including photographs of the sellers as well, and so I just wanted to see if we wanted to pick that up as a discussion point again. But um, I'd be interested in striking the photographs from of sellers from the ordinance. Where's um, that? Where's that appearing? So in section 22-162 records, um, in the text change area underlined, it says, in addition, every palm broker shall photograph any merchandise it receives, buys, and sells, and shall photograph any sellers of such items. So I'm, I'm really happy to, you know, contribute to a database of items that are being sold at pawn shops, but I, um, I don't feel that there's any, you know, sort of there shouldn't be an assumption that this is illegal activity, and so I don't feel like the identities of these individuals should be sent to some sort of police da database to be accessed for, um, for for reasons that are purely, you know, commercial and legitimate and legal. I agree. 
I stated my position on that, which is the same as yours. I would, I would, if you're making a motion to strike that last clause, and shall photograph any sellers of such items, mm -hmm. and I, I, just, I would support deletion of that. Clause. And I just want to note that the um, photograph of any sellers of such items also appears in section 66-32, section C. Um, it just re-articulates the same language and clause, and I'd be interested again in striking out the photographs of sellers from both areas. Okay. Sorry. I second that. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor. Is there any discussion on the motion? Other, other than, than, than some sort of paranoia about Big Brother, which really is founded nothing but no, nothing realistic, um, I, I think this just all this does is just provide additional evidence. So if somebody comes in and brings in a, a legal uh, stolen material, which is not uncommon in that business, then having the evidence of, of the person have their picture there along with the material itself, it's great that the material is photographed so we can get it to the rightful owner, but having it in a police database where it's not gonna be disseminated to the public, uh, I'm wondering where is the harm? I mean, why, I mean, I'll ask the makers of this motion, why do we photograph people that are arrested? Now, they're not convicted, they're not even, there's not even, a, there's not even a, a legal point, there's not, not a legal motion, but we still photograph them. Sure. So what's your point here? Uh, um, so let's go back and revisit all these laws and get rid of all police photographs because somehow these people's picture is in a, is in a police database. So if there's, in my point, if there's merit to that, and the same controls are there for, for police photographs when they're up, upon arrest, why would this body not think that the same controls are in place for pawn broke for, for this ordinance? So I guess if you could help me out with that question, sure. I, I might be more amenable to, to uh, supporting it. Councilor McGivern? If you walk into Macy's at any moment from the, the, the crossing of the threshold, including the dressing rooms, you're on camera. So if it's a tool for the police that the pawnbroker is required to provide a picture of a seller, I, I agree with Councillor Barley. You know, it, it's, it's how else are we gonna catch the people who are bringing the illegal stuff? We're, we're on camera all day. Big Brother's taken over. You know, we didn't, didn't wait for the year 2525, it's here. You know, there, you, anywhere in the mall you walk in, you're on camera. Any, any place, you know, you think about this. You know, you're, you are on camera and public. being recorded. So if, if we can get a person who is dumping off stolen materials to a pawnbroker, dumping off illegally in the alleyway with cameras, why wouldn't we want to require the pawnbroker who's making money on this to be able to provide this to the police? Thank you. Um, Attorney Cunha, um, I have a question. I get one every once in a while. <laughs> um, in terms of developing this language, I'm just interested to know if it's common in other ordinances that it would include photos of the items and photos of the sellers, um, if you know. I didn't really have, have time to look. I did okay. find that some other communities have, there were a few news articles I found um, that other communities are instituting, I think, the computer system that Councillor Bartley had a gentleman come in to speak about, and those were in Worcester County. Um, and I did, it, it actually, I wasn't able to find the actual ordinance, but the article did say that Worcester had amended their ordinance to require the photographs in conjunction with the use of this um, program. So, I mean, most of these ordinances, as far as pawnbrokers and secondhand dealers, are very old and out of date. So, mm -hmm. um, but it seems like probably people are starting to change them to require new technology. So, okay, thank you. Councillor Jourdain. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you, thank you. I, I do have patience once in a while. Uh, I try, uh, it is a virtue. Um, well, where to begin? Um, let's just start with, this is a commercial transaction. I make, I don't know how many commercial transactions uh, periodically in the course of my life um, that I go through. Certainly not all of them are video recorded, I would hope not, or videotaped. 
uh, or I um, but to the extent that they are um, I'm certainly not transmitted into a police database um, I mean good lord I mean uh, even in all of the scenarios uh, whether I'm at Macy's or I'm at uh, you fill in the blank commercial transaction those I may be sitting you know there's Kevin he walks to and you know this didn't happen because I haven't bought her anything but Kevin walks to the jewelry <laughs> counter to buy his lovely wife a new you know piece of jewelry I guess I am on a camera and then I walk to the register and I purchase this and then I walk out the store okay um, but that DVR video of Kevin walking to jewelry counter to register and then out the door is at Macy's. It's held by Macy's and probably after 30 days or so they redub over it and that's the end of it. Whereas what is being suggested here is um, that that information, my photo, that I actually stand into some sort of photography saying time out at the time of transaction Mr. Jordan I need your photo and by the way I'm linking this over to you know Jim Nusswanger's uh, computer at you know HPD and he's gonna you know or him or some deputy of his is going to filter through these the next day and they're sitting in some database housed down at the HPD um, you know I don't know I don't feel comfortable with that I think it's overkill here's the other thing the information that you want to people have to show already photo ID when they go to purchase this they have to give their name they have to give their address there's a photo of the item if this person turns out to be some sort of uh, criminal uh, they're gonna have ample information to try back to this person that they don't need the photo because they could simply ask for the person's license to prove their identification and verify the information that they they get there. Um, you know, other big transactions like you know, for example, um, you purchase a new vehicle. You have a you trade in another car to purchase this other car. Um, no one takes my photo at the dealership to say you know. If it turns out that this car was stolen that you went and used as a trade-in uh, for this other car, you know, we've got your photo right here at Central Command to to immediately pounce on you at the DA's office. Um, you know, I just think we're getting to a point of that's a little bit of overkill. I think we got enough checks in place here. I, I just don't see um, this, this notion that... You know, we're uploading people's personal photos into a police computer system. I think you've got the merchandise in there. You've got that. I, I, I think it's it's unnecessary. Um, you know, and there's a whole host of civil liberty things that go into that. Uh, you know, I, I just don't feel that we, we do that for any other type of commercial transaction. What if, you know, I will use that same Macy's scenario. I walk into Macy's. Well, you don't know where I got the money. I go walk up to a counter and I pay cash for the the lovely ring or bracelet I just purchasing for my wife. Um, I just mugged some old lady for five hundred dollars to go in now and purchase. Well, maybe that commercial transaction should be I should be photographed at the counter and that should be sent into the police database because it's it is possible I could be committing a criminal act that they could use that information at a future date. I mean. The reality is there has to be some presumption um, that people are coming in, these are lawful transactions, and probably, I mean, I don't know, how many how many people do we prosecute for bringing stolen merchandise in? I don't know, um, through pawnbrokers. Um, probably one in 500 transactions. I'd be surprised. Let's see what the statistics are on that. But I think that's a bridge too far for me. I felt uncomfortable with that when this was originally proposed. Love all the other... Um, love all the other changes that you know Councilor Bartley makes here all excellent well founded I just think the photograph of every person sell, you know, selling an item is just a bridge too far for me Bartley were you in the queue? Uh, no I think Councilor she was ahead of me but. and then Councilor McGivern and then are you in the queue? Thank you um, so uh, not to reiterate the points that Kevin just made but I just I also think that when Macy's has the camera out 
it's their personal property. It's not fed right into the um, computer database. Um, I do want to mention that when we had the representative of the computer database, the police computers da database, um, in for a conversation, he told us that um, they're taking photos of the merchandise already, and this change just makes the um, photograph go into the computer um, systems. So that didn't seem um, unduly o onerous for the um, uh, business owners. Um, and the business owner who came to this particular meeting mentioned that um, in keeping the book, they are often taking photographs of licenses um, in order to um, maintain their book. But their book is different than, again, that police computer system. And it says right here in, in the, first, the first paragraph that, you know, the, the book shall keep, you know, such, such things and the name and residence of the person pawning or pledging the good. So we're, we're getting the name. We're getting the address. Um, they said it was very common practice to take a photo of the, of the license, but that license and that image is not being fed into the computer database that's being um, maintained by the police um, or this regional unit that, that um, was creating the dat database in this case. So that's, that's my, my grievance with the seller's photograph being taken. So, Councilor McGivern. Real quick, I, I, I get the point, but respectfully just want to point out is buying and selling is two different things. When when Kevin buys, you know, Mrs. Jordan a piece of jewelry, it, it's wonderful. You are on video, but it'll probably never go to be seen by anybody because you made a legal purchase. Uh, you, you walk outside into the mall parking lot, assuming that's the jewelry store we used, and you're mugged. The person who mugs you takes the piece of jewelry, if he's dumb, which most of them are too smart, walks back in the mall and there's three kiosks that are buying jewelry. Okay, now he has no proof because it doesn't belong to him that that piece of jewelry belongs to him. That's why we require these licenses, these people who deal in it, to do these things. And and I think the language is tough. I, I get your points, but the the point is, when something happens, and, and and I'll use more than one example. A long time ago, our house is on the parade route, and two days later we got broken into. They found my class ring at Joel's Jewelers three weeks later, after the police department detectives went around the city, around the mall, Chicopee, looking for the items that were stolen from our house. Now, if everything was connected, they would have picked up Chucky a little bit quicker if they just had to go into their computer and say, hey, where's Joel's class ring? Where's the grandfather's ring that was stolen? And then connected to the picture of the person that sold it to the second hand dealer. And that, that's the key. This database doesn't have to be kept by the police department, but used by the police department. And we've put that, we put that in language too in the past in terms of not allowing the police department to, to have a, a, or not allowing the police department to use a permanent database. And I believe, I don't know if it was with the camcorders on the streets or something, oh, yeah. but we were very careful about the, the language. Plate, the plate systems. The plate they, systems. They can Thank photograph 25,000 yeah. license plates in an hour. Yeah. Yeah. And we all know they drive around anyways and just type those license numbers in it with or without yeah. reason. But that, that's my only point. It, it's not a make or break it, but I, I, I think it's a tool. We, we're, we're all conscious of the amount of overtime we're paying the police department. This is one way to cut down the overtime. Councilor Barrett, I was going to say, uh, since he raised a point, if 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 Mrs. Jordan's uh, diamond ring is is stolen and it's recovered, wouldn't it be nice if we know who knew who stole it? So it's just a piece of evidence that is not disseminated to the public. It's just kept in a secured police database. In my opinion, you're overthinking it, but that's me. And it was recommended by the state police as well. So so. Fine. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not going. I'm not going to fight it one way or the other. It was just suggested by the police, and so that's why it was put in here. But that's me. So I've held my peace till the end of the debate. So um, I have a few points to make. So if I go to BJ's and I want to get a card to spend my money, I have to get my picture taken in order to get the card so I can spend my own money. That there's no question about whether I'm legal or not. If I go to a bank, I have to show an ID to cash a check, even if I'm, my money's in the bank. I have to prove that I'm 
who I say I am, if we find the person voluntarily giving their picture offensive when they go to pawn an item because we think there isn't a high degree of potential for crime, then why, conversely, are we requiring them to hold the items for 30 days? The reason we have them hold the items for 30 days is because there's been a history and a pattern of thefts related to these items that are turned in. Therefore, the people turning them in didn't own them. So I think in this example, there's a long pattern and track record that there is at least a greater percentage of likelihood that something going into this arena is stolen than the normal business of buying and selling things. So to me, it's in the public. You're in the public, you're bringing the item in, you're selling it. Nobody's making you sell the item. So you don't have to have your picture taken because you don't have to go there at all. So, but if you go in and they say, to sell the item, I'm gonna take a picture of the items and I'm gonna take your picture, you still have the decision. Nah, I don't want my picture taken. So you don't have to turn the item in. It's all, you know, free commerce. Don't get your BJ's card if you don't want your picture taken, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm comfortable with this. I think the police came in with it as a tool. They don't use the database to look at pictures and put people in lineups for this from the presentation that we had. I don't even think they keep the database forever. How about a compromise? They, re they recycle it. The people come off the database, they correct? So it's a temporary thing, just like the video would be temporary. And so I don't have a problem with it personally. All right. In, in, the, in the realm of, of compromise, first of all, there's nothing in here that says it's temporary. Once it oh, goes into the uploaded, temporary. there's no time limit here that says it's erased after 30 days. But why don't we say this? What if we agree to do the seller photographs, but, not, but they're held by the pawnbroker? not the police because for all intents and purposes that's already occurring now because they're taking pictures of the licenses, licenses. what do you well, think of that, that the, well it, the police would have to go if they say you know they have they already have the picture of the proverbial joe class ring they're gonna they're scanning through that they find the item now they want to prosecute bad person who who sold this to them they will then go to the store and get the photo of him, the rec. I, I bet you they're going to go to the store anyways, because they're going to want his name, the residence, all that information. Well, it's almost like you're saying, don't trust the police. We trust the pawnbroker more than the police. That's, that's well, um, yeah, well, I don't. Well, well I do not. Pulling people into a police database for no reason at all versus yeah. having the police say, this "Oh, is the age we old found question. some. Yeah. We found some. Well, you know." How about this? Cr criminal, how, like, how, how about man? sure. How Even about, though, how about this for a compromise? Wait, 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 you guys, we're uh -huh. turning into a round table here. It's really not a round okay. table. Let uh, Council Lisi finish her point. <sighs> Thank you. So, my point again is that we have this process of you know, the, there's a photograph of the license being taken. Um, we're having the pawnbroker keep a book in which. There's lots of evidence and information collected, including the name and residence of the person pawning or pledging such goods. But we're not feeding individuals' photos into a police database. Even our police chief, when he came in, said, you know, we, we could use the database, but we don't keep it. So our even, you know, even people coming into Holyoke, Holyoke citizens that would be protected by, by the police department, don't get that protection because the police department isn't the one that's maintaining that database. It's some other third party um, that's, you know, regionally configured um, and creating this computer system, database system. Um, I think that when you go into BJ's and you get your photo taken, it's because there's, there's a membership. You're, you're, you're becoming a member of this um, purchase and sale group, bulk, bulk buying group. Um, you know, and again, when you go to the bank, you're, you're showing your photo ID. There's no problem with showing the photo ID, but the police department, I'm sorry, not the police, the bank is not force feeding your image into a police database system. Um, so I do think that it's really apples and oranges there. 
I agree, photos are taken all the time. We could, we could, we could use photos um, intelligently if the police want to say, oh, we found some stolen goods. Do you have a record of this item in your pawn shop? Oh, we found the item, now who's the per I mean, they could do you know, the two steps removed to figure out who, who the seller of the good was, um, as opposed to just fe force feeding people um, into a, a huge database. Thank you, Councilor Bartley. So uh, why don't why don't I uh, why why don't we consider maybe tabling this and then I'll I will do some due to, to our next meeting I will get some feedback from from the state police and from others to see wh what they're what they're doing elsewhere because I, I, I hear the concern here it's a fair concern and l let me see what what kind of compromises they can come up with if. If we can't find any compromise, then why don't, you know, maybe in two weeks' time, because there's no, you know, we've been dealing with this for over a year now, there's no rush on this. Uh, if there's no, if there's no middle ground, then we can, you know, we'll strike the language and see how it goes with uh, with that, okay? So let, let me, let me okay. do a little research. So before you make that motion, I just, I just want to make one point, I, and I think that it's a good motion, but if if to the points made the people already have a picture of the person selling the item because they took a picture of their license and so theoretically what you're doing in this whole process is you're digitalizing the book so their pictures already in the book so all you're doing is digitalizing a piece of paper that part which is, is what fine. we do with that's not the issue Linda. The, the, the issue is I don't want this grand central repository in the HPD of anybody that buys things. That's that's the issue. I if they want to have a photo at the pond stuff. Selling stop, things, not selling. Buying, selling. What, selling. But well, whatever. Okay, so we've all made our points, yeah. and Councilor Bartley's going to do some more homework. So I'll motion, it, I'll motion a motion at table, if I can. Okay. Well, don't we do this discussion? I mean, I, so uh, we're good. All okay. in favor? All right. Aye. Aye. Okay, so motion to take up item so moved. 15. Do we have our oh, motion to remove 15? Yes, Go second ahead. that. All in favor? Aye. All right. Filed by Councilor Jordan, ordered that a handicap sign be placed in front of 148 Leary Drive, but, but the one that I have in front of me is for Newton Street. Um. Heard this a while ago to disabilities. I think that's the problem, and I didn't get it back on. Because we sent it over on January 19th. That's when it went to City Council. Last there, there would have been that would have been because that would have been the twenty something of right of January. Um, Unless they didn't get to it the first meeting, but. Well, the thing of it is. Um, we haven't had any report back on this one, because this poor uh, person and their child. This is a child that, and the mother that needs this. And housing said, "Fine, go ahead, put it up." They don't each, for Bowden Village, they don't. They don't care. So this one that did come back that we can't take up because it's not on the agenda. We could take it up, right? Can we? Well, I mean, it's which one? Uh, it's Newton nine. Street? It's seventy nine Newton Street, and it was before us before, but it was incomplete. Yeah. So we tabled it and sent it out. So it's tabled in committee. Okay. So. Yeah, you can remove it from the table. If if. You would like to make a motion to do that. Technically, we have a rule that says all prior um, items that are on the table are supposed to be listed on committee agendas. Right. We do have a rule on that. We do. Well, because technically, supposed to be listed first. Well, Karen, we, we can take this up. Is that that's accurate? Is it? I just got it. Well, it's dated one twenty, but we had. I had a note on it to Ryan to please send to back to the clerk 
for follow-up because it was incomplete per Don Welch. So Ryan sent it back to the clerk. It went wherever it went. Then it went back to disabilities. And now it's back from Don Welch with the date of 1-2016. Is he OK with it? For his site inspection. So, and it. And we're still waiting for a report from Don anyways, right? We're waiting on a couple other things. But the point is, we, so, didn't, we didn't expect to take this up. Because we didn't know we had it, so we can take it up because it's tabled. Yes. OK, so we have a motion to take it up. Yeah. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. OK, so the item before us is the handicap plate in front of 79 Newton Street for Carlos Garcia. And it was reviewed, and a site inspection was completed by Don Welch on 1-2016. He recommends approval because there is no off-street parking on Newton Street. Make a motion be adopted. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So on the 15, we're going to uh, keep it on the table till next meeting, and hopefully we'll have till March well, 8th. Well, if you want to. I mean, I, 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 I want to just, I want to just adopt it. It's non-controversial. I can't imagine. Yeah. Well, how about if we take it up and adopt it pending receipt of the inspection? And I'll track down the inspection. Sure. How's that? Okay. Sure. I, I mean, that's sure. I, I think it's I'm, okay the way it is, but I mean, I, this is totally non-controversial. Yeah, I, I mean, I checked what housing. This is just a space that you, you can see them. Other people have them up there. It's, it's it, would, a, it would be great um, just to get the report. We need the report. The We're, yeah, worse comes to worse. So, yeah. so All right. adopted so, the legal form. And this is for the handicap sign in front of 148 Leary Drive. Correct. For Giovanni Correa. Correct. So motion seconded. Motion to adopt. I'll put it to legal form. Put it to legal form. I'll All in favor? Uh, aye. aye. Yeah. Aye. And then just point of order, Madam Chair, before we adjourn. Yes. Uh, the, the gentleman who was here early on, that was that address. He did is, email me. It's uh Okay, he emailed the address. Okay, then I want to, as long as you know the address, and then I'll, if we could Taylor put that, Street. Taylor Street, and then Paul Broker on the next agenda. Oh, yes. Uh, is it on he? Or, uh, yeah. He, he was here before he, yes. before you had a chance. Sorry, uh, he was here and left. He yes. had a chance to weigh in on that. He already had indicated to me that it, he had an indication from the Disabilities Commission that they would be denying the application. But we haven't gotten that I report don't, officially. I don't have anything in yeah. front of me yet. But, but, he, but apparently he had a conversation with So Dan. I couldn't do anything with it. Okay. So and, and he was here. He wanted to give a, some but comments. He, and but he well, indicated fine. that okay. to me. So I just said, I don't have it back yet. All right. That's what he, he said was here. I told him to reach out to you anyways, Rebecca, because you filed it originally. Oh, Josie filed it? Oh, okay. Well, there you have it. So we'll see what happens. Sure. Second. All in favor. Aye. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you all. Au revoir.